Here we go. Here we go, yo. It's the Drew. It's it's <laughs> it's the New York Hardcore Chronicles live, live from New York City. How's everybody doing? Looking forward to today's show. I hope you are too. What is going on? What's up, Chris? Good, good to see. Hey, what's happening in London, John? Yeah, this is gonna be a good one today. Looking forward to it. Hope everybody's well or getting well. You know, Marla, what's up? You're watching a show live. How rare. How was Slap, how was Slap Shot and Sheer Terror the other night? Yes, Nausea. Good. If you're excited, I'm excited. You know? Now representing Astoria, Queens, Astoria, Lou. What's going on? Robert in Scotland. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all happening. So here we go. Here we go, yo. What's up? What the fuck's going on in the background there? I'm, uh, I'm here with the crickets. I'm, uh, I'm somewhere in Long Island at my nephew's baby's christening. So What's what that? goes better What's with that? death metal? What's that, nature? Nature. I'm in the wild. I'm like something out of like a, like a future. I'm like something out of a science fiction, like Logan's Run, bro. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like something out of Logan. I'm like, what is that, nature? Like... Yeah, there's birds chirping. I got crickets next to me. There's buzz, there's bees buzzing. I didn't know such things existed. Must step outside your door. No, never. <laughs> Everything comes to me. I don't go anywhere. I, I live in a, I live in a like a pre-war building. Like I've said, there could be a nuclear holocaust, and I, I won't even know. Well, you're like you'll be like the Omega Man, like Charlton Heston, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of places that you. You did have to go. How was your show last night? Show was good last night. Wait, I got I got some pictures. Um, the show was good. In in at Dingbats in New Jersey, it was it was it was a lot of people. You know who was really great last night was the Take. They they the Take was great. And these, oh, these nice. are these are some Gina photos from Women of the Pit. Gina Marie, the, the Take man, the Take bring it. They're, they're fucking great these days. Oh, they're so good. They're so yeah. good. Yeah. They really are. And the new record's really good. They just, uh, they're fun. You know, they're just a fun band. They got, you, you know, know, Scott, Scott Roberts knows how, like knows how to, he's a good front man. He knows how to work, you know, work the audience. Yeah. He's, he's, he's really good. You know? Yeah, he is. Definitely. Um, and ice cold killers, right? Here's an ice cold, ki- the ice cold killers. He always gets pissed when I call them ice cold killers. It's the ice cold killers. Yeah. There you go. The there he ice, is. The ice cold. Killer. Nice. Gotta yeah. love that mic. That mic is the way to go. Yeah. That's a nice shot, by the way. Yeah. And then, and we played, you know, it's, it, you know, it's always awkward being, it's always awkward being up there, but, you know. Well, you had, you had the return of drummer Mike behind the kit too, right? You know what? Let me tell you something about playing with fucking Mike, man. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I could bitch about the guys in my band. Yo, you know what sucks about singing for this band? I got to stand in front of Mike. And he <laughs> plays so loud that, like, every time he cracks that snare drum, it, like, it goes through my friggin' body, man. Yeah, no, he's a powerhouse. He really is. And he's, I mean, I know he was so excited to be back when I spoke to him, so. The, the guy hits, like, a t- he hits so hard that, like, all I hear is a snare drum going, crap, 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 crap. <laughs> Fuck, man. That's awesome. Yeah. And how about the spoiler? They were great. They were great. That's our friend Alan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What a, it was a great, great bill. Really was just, uh, yeah. you know, excited. Great hey, shots you know, by Gina, you by know, the way. You know, it's traumatizing for us to play outside of the five boroughs in New York City, you know? <laughs> it's like I always say, we only play if the New York City subway system goes there, we'll play there. But other than that... So this was traumatic, like playing in New Jersey, you know, like. And not playing at, the, you know, like four o'clock in the afternoon. I know. It was past my bedtime. <laughs> we, we went on at 8.15. I was fucking shot, man. You know? <laughs> what happened to the matinee? Yeah, here's a, here's a shot of, of, uh, of Alan. And uh, they were great, man. He, put to, he, he quarterbacked this bill. Here he is with some of his, was it the front rail crew? Oh, yeah. Yep. That's Those guys, that. Those guys are are hardcore devotees. Let me tell you. 
Yeah, they, they, they really good dudes. They they're, they're they're a passionate bunch, you know. Oh yeah, no, they really are. They're the. Do you know that um, one of the guys actually bought the sign. The, yeah. The we saw from the he, our he show. It, yeah. He brought it last night and we signed it. Oh, see, that's awesome. We you signed know. the sign. You signed the sign. Hey, I like these pictures you sent me. I see you got yourself some new friends. Oh, what do you got there? <laughs> oh, there we go. Yes, actually, you know what? My 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 farm just got 13 brand new goat rescues. So I got a whole is, new is, bunch is, of friends. Do, do female goats have horns? I think they do. Because I I think that this I think this is a female goat, but I didn't know females have horns like that. I think they do. I think I think the females do have you know, horns. Well, hey, out so there, the... do female goats have horns? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure we'll get an answer real fast. <laughs> you know, like that. That looks like a female. This guy looks like a male. This guy. This guy got a male look about him. He looks like. Oh, he's, he, looks he like, is a male. Yeah. He looks like one of the guys that come to a hardcore show. You know. That, and I, his his horns actually almost crisscross in the back. Yeah. 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 He's going to be, listen, these guys, you know, th these guys are like waiting to be on the next Venom album cover, you know? Yeah. yeah. So cool. I'm, I'm sorry. I got, you know, the uh, Amy from the NDD texted me, no goats, no glory. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that is awesome. So. Oh, is a female goat a you or is that a sheep? All right, let's not go down this rabbit hole. Let's not go down this. <laughs> you are, you open this door. Now you know, we're walking through it. <laughs> they both. Oh, here we go. They both have horns, male and female. But who's you know hornier? What? You know what? I don't want horns. I want a tail. Well, what if you can only have the tail if you have horns? I want a tail. I don't really want horns. I'll take whatever. the horns. <laughs> I'll take the horns. Exactly. All right, man. Well, congratulations. And on that note, on that note uh, I'll let you go back to your christening. Yes, sir. There's is nothing more metal is it a than christening? that. Is it a christening like in The Godfather, like that? Oh, yeah, where they, they dip them in the water and they make them renounce the devil and everything. Yes. Do you know, do you know, who, the, uh, do you know who the baby was in The God? Here, let, let's see who gets this one, okay? Who was the baby that was christened? In The Godfather. Who was the baby? We'll see how long it takes someone to respond yeah. to that one. They're all, everybody's looking on fucking. Uh, Everyone's Googling. Yep. Googling. Who's the baby? Oh. And I, I believe the baby is. Ray Hogan also... got it. Ray Hogan yep. got it. Sophia Coppola. Yep. And wasn't she, didn't she also get an Oscar for directing? Directing what? She didn't direct I believe it she got an Oscar for directing. Oh, was uh, Living in Oblivion or some shit? Was it Lost in Translation? Lost in Translation, or... right. Yeah. Tim Carey. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It was me, motherfuckers. All right. <laughs> All right. Hey, All right. Go, go do you, brother. I'll talk to you soon. Peace in the Middle East. That's right. This is the one, the only, often imitated, never duplicated New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. And we are sponsored by... New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, Upstate Records, and 126 Hardcore Clothing. They're a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise. They're about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your weak-ass clothing game at www.126clothing.com. That said, let's clear the deck. Let's bring our guests on. Let's make sure nobody's killing each other in the chat room. Um, everybody okay? Oh, thank you. I'm on a big Zappa kick right now. A big, big Frank Zappa kick right now. Listening to nothing but Zappa. Listening to – I've been this, this whole week I've been listening, uh, you know uh, – Nothing but Zappa and Napalm Death all week. <laughs> so there you go. Let's clear the deck. Let's bring our guest on. Here we go. Today's guest. Today's guest is a British 
bassist and songwriter hailing from Brosley, Shropshire, England. In his incredibly proficient career, he is known for his work with the bands Warhammer, Heresy, Unseen Terror, Blood from the Soul, Born to Murder the World, Tronos, Dark Sky Burial, Meat Hook Seed, Malformed Earthborn, Lockup, Bruheria, Venom's Concept, Absolute Power, Liquid Graveyard, and many more. And of course, since 1987, the band he has played over 5,000 gigs with, Napalm Death. Please welcome, coming at us from Birmingham, West Midlands, Mr. Shane Embury. Hey, man. Hey. Hello. How are you, How are you buddy? I'm all right, man. It's pretty good. Sunday evening. Kids are in bed, I hope. So, yeah, should be okay, you know. How's uh how the how, how's how's married life with the kids treating you? Ah, uh, some days good, some days uh not so good. But that's just life, you know. It's just uh, you have you have two little girls, right? I have a five year old son, uh, well, almost five year old, and a nine year old daughter. Oh, so. there you go. You you got you got the best. You got both worlds. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for you, man. Let's uh first off, I love the book, man. I really, I really enjoyed reading the book. Thank um you. and uh you know, I, I enjoyed the tone of it, you know. Uh I, I just it just flowed really well and uh I, I enjoy I enjoyed that part of it. Uh before we sort of get get into the into some of the early stuff, why now? What was the impetus to to putting the book out now? Oh, uh, well, I think probably during the pandemic, it was uh, obviously a crazy time for everybody. And um, creative, creatively wise, I was getting into different kind of music projects. Because uh, I'd never been at home for such a long period of time, ever. Yeah. You know? So it was, that. <laughs> it was that. So trying to balance family life versus what I normally do, which is make music and tour. And so uh, I was, it was suggested, would you be interested in doing a book? And I used to kind of joke about it, you know, drinking a few beers. I go, oh, yeah, this is, one, this is one for the book, just laughing. And then, of course, they suggested do a book. I thought, well, why not? You know, it's like you, no one really gets a chance to do it. So, yeah, and that was did, that. Did you, did you do it the, the old-fashioned way? Did you type it out or did you dictate it? Or how, how did that work for you? Um, I'm, they, they asked me, do you want to write it? And, I'm, I mean, I probably would not have been able to do it if I did, did that. Yeah. Really. So a longtime friend of mine, a guy called Dave Everly, journalist, mm-hmm. He came on board and decided, well, he suggested let's do it chronologically from the very very beginning. So he would pose the questions because he'd been on tour with us a few times here and there. We knew each mm-hmm. other. And that helped because I, I have no problems talking at all. You know, right. it's just, <laughs> you just got to kind of prod me. And I'm like, okay. Gotcha. I, want to under something. I may veer off on tangents, of course, but um, as everyone can do. But uh, yeah, so he would kind of pose the questions and then we went with it, really, you know. Yeah, it's, it's uh, grab my uh, let me grab my notes. So, you know, what I li- you know, you know, you know what I liked in the book. You, you know, one thing that you did in the book that I really liked is the the eyewitness testimonials. It was it was it was a nice it was a nice break. You know, uh, for for those that are wondering what I'm referring to, what 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 Shane had was you hear his voice and he's telling a story. And then you'd have an eyewitness testimonial from somebody that was actually there in, in those times and, and kind of give, give their take on it. I, I thought it added a really nice dimension to it. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it's, uh, I mean, when you, when you, you have the, ch- well, the chance to do a book, you know, you, uh, you feel you're a certain personality, but it's also interesting to see what other people think about you, you know, and uh, yeah. it's keen to have that because, you know, um, there are different sides to me, really. I guess <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's uh, let's let's kick it around a little bit. We're going to talk about some stuff in the book, and, and we'll make our arrangement. it. How did you come up? Did did you grow up in a musical household? How did music come into your life? Uh, well, I'm from a small village, as you mentioned. Um, in the early seventies, we had a program on on the BBC One called Top of the Pops. Just a regular countdown of what was happening. In the Midlands, there was a band called Slade, you know, which uh, 
I liked because they had loud, they had, they looked crazy. They had loud guitars, double bass drum kits. You know, my mum used to play the Beatles and everything. It's all the all radio was always on. Radio was always on. Sure. So that kind of got me into it. The, the actual theme tune, the top of the pops, was a whole lot of love by Led Zeppelin. So from about the age of five or six, you're hearing this guitar, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. I, thought, I like that guitar. I like that drums. And then um, that sort of set me on the path, I guess, in Sabbath a little bit later. And stuff. You, you, know, you, know, you, know what's, you, you know what's interesting? It, it, it seems like when we talk to a lot of American artists that are, that are our age coming up, they cite Kiss. When we speak to artists from the UK a lot, they cite Slade coming up. And 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 here in the states, Slade wasn't that that big, when, when, you know. And it's interesting, like Slade was really influential over there. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, very close to where where I come from. I mean, you know, they're yeah. like, they're there on TV all the time. But I think uh, Gene Simmons from Kiss was a Slade fan, mm. but he also realized that, of course, because of I guess maybe the the accents or whatever, it just wouldn't translate. So uh -huh. that. That may have been, a, you know, a bit of an impetus for Kiss, but um, yeah, that's you know, visually loud. I liked all that kind of stuff, so that was my beginning. Yeah, wasn't Charles Darwin from from your hometown? About sixteen miles away, Charles Darwin, and also down the road from me is the world's first ever iron bridge. It's, it's you know, it's the uh, steep the, industri the industrial revolution started on my doorstep, pretty much. I guess. Wow. And of course, went into Birmingham and surrounding areas. You know, I mean, sure, sure. 10, 15 miles down the road, you got Slade, then you've got like Sabbath, twenty, just a few a bit further, and so Sabbath, 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 Birmingham, right? Sabbath, Birmingham, which is like the other side of where I live now. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And and of course, Sabbath always cites the fact that um, they 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 came up in an industrial town, and that had a big effect on their sound. I think, I think this, I mean, for for a while, I didn't know whether I believed that, but I think, I think, it, I think it's true. Uh, you know, the yeah. whole area. I say where I grew up for sure. I mean, Judas Priest was just down the road. Zeppelin were, and it's just like, yeah. it's escapism. You know, when you kind of right. when you when you're faced with that nine to five day of steel factories, which which I did for a while until I met the guys yeah. from Next Farm, or going out and just trying to follow you. Your destiny, or whatever you want to call it, you know, it's, you're going to choose the latter, really. I think probably it, it reminds me of um, Joe Cocker and even the Def Leppard guys who are from Sheffield, That's right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Them, them saying like they, that growing up in, in Sheffield had and, and sort of that uh, that environment had a huge effect on on their music. I think so. I mean, you know, even if it's subconsciously, you know, it's escapism to me. Rock and roll, heavy metal, whatever you want to call it, was my sort of uh, go-to thing, you know, when uh, right. times are down a little bit, you know, it's a bit bleak. So, yeah, you just you just did. And uh, it's ironically, my area is surrounded by heavy metal bands, really. Hey, here's our old friend, uh, Kevin Sharp. What's up, Kevin? Yeah. That, thanks for stopping by, buddy. Good to, good to see I you. Know that guy. I know that guy. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was just on the show recently. He's yeah. great, great, great show he did. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Detroit, the Detroit of the UK. Yeah, it's that's 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 fair enough, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, also, you know, in the book you mention uh, being as a child loving horror movies and yep. uh, the, the, the Hammer horror films uh, being a huge influence. Can you tell us about that? Well, I mean, you know, you know, my mom and dad, they worked all week, you know, and uh, Friday night was the, uh, the social club, as it was called, for a quick pint, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was with my aunts and uncles babysitting, and, of course, they'd let me stay up late on a Friday night. It was the Hammer Horror Night, you know, and I'd watch The Gorgon or Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and I was loving that, really. You know, I loved the music as well, I guess, and but I loved, the, I loved horror movies. And so, yeah, and then summertime, they would have double bills, you know, Universal horror movies, that was just perfect for me. I was just, you know, it matched the music, everything. I was just, it's all escapism, you know. I loved it really. With with, with those with those um, Hammer horror films, with with those on the the television, uh, like, no. or, or did you have to go into the theater to see those? No, no they're, they're on the TV. They're, and it, it was a ritual in a way because as I got a little bit older, you know. 
my dad would go up to have a few pints. He would always come back from whatever the fish <laughs> shop with some fish and chips. It was fish and chips. Then we watched actually Soap, this comic, comedy program when the States was on. So yeah. Billy Crystal. So we'd watch Soap, and then it would be, the be the Friday Night Horror movie. And I would be, that was just it every week. And I was yeah. like, that was it. You know, King. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had uh, something called Chiller Theater here, you know, as, as, yeah. as kids. And there was, you know, that you'd see some of the, you know, the classics in either Living Dead or or Creature from the Black Lagoon and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. I loved all that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 did, I did too. Yes. Dr. Fives was one of the first horror films. Oh, I just yeah. There's a, yeah. there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a guy over here. He does like low. Well, lo fi, I don't know how you describe it. it, makes these like really bespoke sculptures. And he's made a Dr. Fives sculpture. Mm. Every time I look at it, I'm like, I must have this Dr. Fives. <laughs> there you do you, do you, do, are you, are you, uh, do you collect stuff? Do you have a lot of stuff? Are you one I of these guys? Yeah, are you yeah. one of those guys that kind of has everything? Yeah, yeah, me and my wife were arguing about that this just this morning, but there you go. <laughs> but yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. You, you must, yeah. You must have uh, quite quite a bit of stuff. What what was the first live music you saw uh, that, that that you went out and what was the first live uh, sh show you saw? You remember? Well, I think trying to get to Birmingham was tough because um, one of us had to sort of miss out on a show every. There's a few of us in the village that liked heavy metal, so my first band I saw was a band called Tigers of Pantang. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, and that was in Birmingham Odeon, which is just wasn't now. That, wasn't that John Sykes? John Sykes was in the band when I saw them, yeah. 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 So, mm -hmm. uh, so that would be the first. And, of course, every so often there was like five of us. And only four could go in my, in my friend's dad's car. So one, every now, you know, it was a cycling. Yeah. So that was the first one. And I think then Judas Priest after that. And then maybe Ozzy. Um, I had tickets to see Ozzy uh, die of a madman, but I think, I don't know what the hell happened. Uh, he cancelled for some reason, and then Randy Rhodes mm. passed away shortly after, which was a bit of a bummer. But there you go. Yeah. Is in order to see shows like that, was that local, or did you had to you had to travel to Birmingham? Or yeah. well, my my friends, my friend Mitch Dickinson, who was who was in Warhammer and Unseen Terror with me, his dad was from Birmingham, so they moved to where I lived. So he would mm. drive us there. He'd go and see his mom and dad while we. We're down the front of the row, headbanging and all that kind of thing. So yeah, that was that. So what was what was the what was the progression to, from these bands to what was the first sort of, dare I say, extreme music or extreme metal? I, I know in the book, and I quote, you say, you know, you say metal spoke to you. Uh, was it was there an aha moment, or how did that play out? Um, I mean. Obviously the Slade thing, but I go into I go into Sabbath around seventy eight or something seventy nine. Mm. <clears throat> then Lizzie and Judas Priest, because it was a record record club, so you you, you had a choice of three albums, really cheap. Oh, and they, yeah. they, you know, so so you'd order you say you'd, you'd order you'd order three albums, but then they'd start sending these other ones, which you just yeah yeah yeah. We had that here too, Columbia House. It was called. Yeah. A, month later, a month later, they'd send me like Meatloaf, Bad and Hell. I'm, I'm not interested in that one. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but you know the first three were great. Jailbreak, Thin Lizzy, Never Say Die, and then Killing Machine by Priest. I'm like, well, there you go. And um, right. so you get into that, and you start looking at this uh, uh, news. Same, it's called Sounds. It's like a music newspaper, and I came across a band called Venom. You know, yeah, sure. um, they had the inverted crosses, all the stuff that was ticking the boxes. And I thought, well, I need to check this band out. And um, the album came out, Welcome to Hell, from a small record shop close by. Mm -hmm. I got it. My dad was sleeping because he's on nights from work, and I just put the headphones on. And Sons of Satan came out. And I'm like, "This is it. Thank you very much." And off we go. And I'm then all I, in. Yeah, pretty much. And then that was that was that. And then my friend Mitch, his, he he had a, uh, a step brother who was into punk rock, like Dead Kennedys, Exploited, mm -hmm. so and Discharge. So he played me these bands, and I'm like, "Oh, this well, that kind of sounds heavy yeah. to me. I'm into that too." And then the crossover starts right there, you know, because he right. likes he likes a little bit of the heavier stuff like Venom, I like to discharge and dead candies. And so the journey began there. Mm. And that was that was the beginning anyway, you know. 
Yeah, I can relate. I mean, being a an American hardcore, you know, kid, hearing you know, dis, discharge uh, was uh, was a bit of a, a a crossover. You know, even discharge was a big big part of it, and venom. You know, he, he, hearing that stuff was heading in a taking it in a. It was, it was it was just it, I, mean, I don't know. It's, it, I think you know these these sounds are coming out. Like I mean, I had this really old Gary Blaster. It played abnormally laid, which I liked. So I had the cassette. One side was Black Metal by Venom. The other side was City Baby Attacked by Rats by GBA. There you go. I was like, well, there you there you go. Go. It was just perfect for me. It was brilliant. You know? So on rotation, you know. Yeah, um, did you see any of these early punk bands? or did you uh, Hardcore, almost, I don't want to use it, but did you see any of these uh, – did punk bands appeal to you then? Did you go see any of these bands? Uh, I, 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 I love these, but it, being where I lived, it was kind of tricky to get to Birmingham and back in the same day and be getting right. get to school unless, unless we, you know, we were driven there by my friend's dad. So in the early 80s, it was primarily um, metal bands. Sure. Until, until really I became, I don't know, what, what was I, 17 or 18 or whatever? 18, 19, when uh, I met the Napalm guys, mm. and then decided to go to Birmingham a lot. I was, I mean, I mean, until I jumped into the the being in the band, I was kind of a bit of a homebody, really. You know, I didn't really go too many places. I was kind of stuck in the village, <laughs> really. To be fair. Did Did Motorhead play it? Was Motorhead? Uh... Yeah, yeah. We went to see Motorhead. And they played, and uh, but I think in the early eighties. At metal shows, there wasn't too much like it is now, where it's a especially here. It's, it's a massive crossover of, of yeah. scenes. It wasn't. I don't. I don't. I didn't start seeing that until probably eighty six, eighty seven. The whole Anthrax thing, because Anthrax really, you know, SOD and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. People got people got into a lot of American. I mean, people the met a lot of metal people got into American hardcore through the SOD thanks list, you know, and things like that. Yeah. They'd, see, they'd all see all these bands and they oh, check that band out, DRI, let me check it, DRI, let me check it, negative approach or sure. X or verbal abuse or whatever. You, you, um, you, you, excuse me, you you follow the breadcrumbs, right? I mean, that's kind of no. how it was. You, you yeah. basically followed yeah. it along. Yeah. But, so that was, that was an insight. And, of course, I started tape trading in 85, uh, 86, sorry, 84. So that was also good because I started to – Get loads of live tapes, and you know, but but the general metal crowd didn't. I don't think they started to become aware of it. A few people around England, but then you started to see uh, English dogs started uh, playing with metal bands. But they, they, then they started to change a little bit, I think. But so no, I I, I mean, I got to see Exploded much later. I mean, mm -hmm. um, got to hang out. I mean, me and Waddy are pretty good friends. He he once uh, <laughs> he once took me out on a drinking session in. Uh, Edinburgh and scared the hell out of me in his sports car. But uh, there you go. But yes. never got to see him live in the back in the day. You know, that was unfortunate. What Waddy is the Iron Man of punk rock, man. He's out he's out playing now. I think he just had a heart attack, you know, last week. He's out playing yeah. again already. Yeah, there you go. They, I mean, uh, it was kind of strange because I remember seeing they played Dead Cities on this top of the pop show back yeah. in the I, I know um, that clip. I've seen that clip. It's great. Yeah, so I remember, I remember watching yeah. that going, oh, this is amazing. And if you were to pinch me then and said, well, in 30 years' time, you're going to be in the front seat with this guy. And he's going to be driving you around Edinburgh, taking you to bars. I would never have believed it. Sure. They, that's the weird. Yeah, yeah. So, you, know. you, mentioned, you, you mentioned tape trading. And uh, you know, it, I think it, it was, it's an incredible era of, of community and culture and music. And it seems that sort of the, the metal the metal crowd really uh, took to tape cra uh, trading, and it was uh, I mean, of course, you hear the legend, you know, the Metallica stuff. But could could you tell us a little bit about the tape trading culture back then and, and sort of how it worked? Um, well, really, because I had my first band Warhammer, we'd done a demo. We were aware of it. There's a magazine called Metal Forces. At the back of that, there was a thing called Pen Bangers. I found Bill Steer from Cargo's Napalm. Uh -huh. His address, and we wrote, he had he had tapes by Death, Possessed, then Boston Hardcore demos like Siege or Negative Approach. So he just sent me a bunch of cassettes, mm -hmm. and then we started trading. And then you start, then you would, uh, you would collect a list of like album advances, demos, live tapes, rehearsals. You start and you and you start to reach out with other people. You know, you just read these. You get these names at the back. Oh, this guy's got 
he's, he's, he's mentioning all these bands you heard about but never heard. So you'd write to him, right. you'd exchange your tape lists, you'd start trading away. And I had a few, I had lots of friends in all over the States, really. Yeah. You know? And we're getting sent like crumb suckers, live tapes when they did like covers of Inspector Gadget and things like that. You know? Right. Right. Um, it's, incre it's incredible that crumb suckers, and you mentioned Siege from Boston. Amazing that this that that this network pre-internet, you know, that this stuff got over there. Oh, it was great. I mean, it was just to me, it was amazing because uh, I mean, one of my favorite hardcore bands from New York were, were Damage. You know, um, and I think it's just two live to, to, uh, to live albums. I always used to freak out about them, and you know, early. Uh, I mean, my band Unseen Terror when we did a John Peel radio session, we did a Sick of It All cover. I think before people really knew Sick of It All that much. You know. Wow. I didn't know that. Um, we did, I, played, I played drums on that. Uh, Mickey Harris, the Napalm Dead drummer, sings on that. He's trying to impersonate, uh, what's the guy's name from Straight Ahead? Tommy? Uh, Tommy Carroll, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so he, he, was trying to, he was trying to impersonate Tommy Carroll from Straight Ahead. Yeah. And we did, you know, we did the Sing of It All cover on drums. So that was years before, I guess, Sing of It All probably came to Europe. Um, and that was, you know, so tape trading was amazing for me. You know, I just got to know all these these bands, and of course, you had advanced live tape. Um, they had like the advanced album, the first possessed album, or Bonding by Blood. Sure. And it was just like I still went out and bought the records. It just it was amazing, really. I loved it. So, did Un Unseen Terror? Did Unseen Terror happen before Warhammer? No, War. It was Warhammer. And then what happened is I met the guys from Napalm. I went, no, actually, we went well, to let's, see. Let's, let's hold on. Let's here's Warhammer. Right, tell That's us, tell it. us, tell us about Warhammer. Well, you know, we're just four friends in a small village, and we just loved, um, you know, Venom, obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's when the hair, that's when the hair was still fresh, not like now, but um, yeah, yeah. um, and that was in my that's in Mitch's dad's living room. We used to practice in there during the day, and um, so yeah, I mean, uh, we uh, used to rehearse every week. We had like I don't know, got something like. Two hours worth of original songs, you know. Mm -hmm. We played, we played two shows. Uh, they all expected us to do rock, rock and roll covers, and then we came on doing Slayer covers and playing our own stuff, and pretty much terrified the local area. But that was and, and you were you were playing drums. I started playing drums, yeah, originally, yeah, yeah. Wow. And uh, the guy with the Metallica shirt is Mitch, and me and him went on to form on Scene Terror because. I think uh, the other two guys were just kind of they were happy with Metallica and they didn't really want to go beyond. But me and Mitch were tape trading. We we were listening to DRI and all these fast bands, and we wanted to go faster, you know. So that's what we did on Scene Terror, pretty much. That's why we split off. Uh, you mentioned in the book that uh, you guys did this six track this six track demo, and you got it out there. You mentioned in the book, I forgot who it was. Like down the line, years later, you connected with someone who who was a big who loved that tape and and said i i had your demo and uh yeah just weird things like i mean borrowboy from from blabbermouth you know borrowboy give us his old right. fanzine he loved warhammer and yeah. um a couple other people and then just like through the years it was weird um i remember jesse who joined napalm years back he knew of warhammer and just a few people here and there where you would come across who knew, who knew the, the demo and stuff. And um, that was the kind of power of tape trading, really, I guess, Yeah, back in the day. It was the, it was the internet before there was an internet. It was, a, it was, I mean, I used to, I lived in front of a tape deck for a couple of years, for sure. And, uh, and then it broke. And then that was a bit of a catastrophe. But there you go. Yeah. And then Unseen Terror. Yeah, that might, that, I'm sporting a crumb sucker shirt there. Which, wow. Uh, I didn't know that. A friend of mine sent me from New York, and I always thought, was it an original one? And he said, well, yeah, it was. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, that's Mitch's bedroom, all the flyers we used to have. And Wow. So, yeah, I mean, I, I cut my hair at that point. I was going through my very brief straight-edge phase. It lasted about 10 days. Um, and there you go. But, um, you know, check, check your shirts and that kind of vibe. But, um, yeah, that was Unseen Terror. Yeah. Now, you, mentioned, you mentioned that. Early on, you, you went and saw um, Napalm Death uh, live. You, you saw you saw the original incarnation of the band, right? Well, as close as you could. I mean, Napalm Death is a strange beast up until about 91, where there was a right. few like, changes. 
But when I saw them, it was the, it was the A side of Scum lineup. Mickey right. had just Mickey had only been in the band, I think, about five months, the drummer. And he was the one that was really pushing the speed further. Every week he would get faster and faster. Um, and so me and Mitch walk, walked into this place called The Mermaid, which is about 10 minutes from where I live now. Um, and it was just a yeah, all day punk gig. Heresy played, I think uh, Amoebics played maybe. And um, wow. one pound fifty for seven, bands, like three dollars for one for seven bands, amazing value for money. But um, wow. and of course, uh, I saw Napalm Death and they just blew my mind. And then, of course, I became really good friends with them and would always hang out in Birmingham, go to rehearsals and. The tape trading thing started. Mickey started trading tapes. He got his own scene. We all just, you know, it all kind of, they were getting into bands like Celtic Frost because to them it, it sounded like Discharge. It had the same kind of drum beat, you know, sure. dirty guitar sound. So that's when the whole cross, crossover I felt was happening, really. You, you mentioned you mentioned the Mermaid. Um, was Back then, did the, did the punks... And the metal kids did, did was did they get along for the most part, or was there or was there friction there? It was it was well. What happened is, is Mitch Dickinson was in Birmingham uh, uh, doing whatever I don't know what he was doing, probably stealing some records, probably. <laughs> um, but um, and then he had a tap on the shoulder, and it was Justin Broderick, who was now of course from Godflesh, and then Justin was like, "Have you heard? Oh, I see you have a siege. Uh, you wrote siege on the back of your jacket. You might like my band called Napalm Death." So Mitch comes back and goes, hey, let's go and see this man named Bond Death. And when me and Mitch walked in there, I can say probably that there was probably only me, him, and maybe three other people that were what you would call metal, metalheads. Sure. Rest, everyone there was totally mellow, peaceful, cool, no no bad vibes. This was er this was early on in the game. So I, I, just I, like March, sure. March 86. And um, yeah. of course, I had the leather cut up, leather denim cut off, and all these, I had New York City mayhem on the back there, and all these kind of things scrolled in pen, you know. And but Mickey just jumped over and saw saw me. He he fascinated by characters. I guess I was a character, and um, and that's how the friendship began. And the, but there was never no bad vibes. And then a bit by a bit, a few more of my friends came. So I said, "You got to come to this this this, this venue. All these crazy bands are playing. Um, you got to watch them." And um, that's how things started to cross over. And a really nice scene. I met Dig from Earache that day, I believe. Because right. he knew about we knew already knew about Warner. That was the thing. I was surprised. And um I was like, oh, you know, I met Lee Dorian who's with Napalm and Cathedral, and he knew about Warhammer. So there's all this weird we all knew, but we hadn't met each other yet. It was weird. It's it's amazing how back then it was actually in person. You would go and interact with live human beings, and that, that was the community and the culture. Uh, you would go and, and spend time and hang out with people and interact with people and and, and, and it, it you know wasn't it was it wasn't about getting on your phone you, you would go and actually interact with these people in person at, at a place like the mermaid or what we had here in new york city was like the a7 and eventually cbgb's or whatever but uh it was another it was another world you'd actually deal with people in person you know it was well for me it was great because you know i came from a really tiny village where you were you were the outcasts and i mean yeah. i when I when I have I had a job for about six seven eight months at the steel factory and I hated it. They'd mm. already they'd already threatened to fire me once for going to see Celtic Frost, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, I I'm quitting my job." My dad's like, "Why?" I said, "Because I want to go and hang out with Mickey Harris from Napalm Death in Birmingham. I'm going to go on the dole. I'm going to hang out with Mickey Harris." And my dad thought it was insane. I said, "Well, whatever. Uh, I'd rather do that than just whatever than be around this thing. This I mean, it was you know." I appreciate the village now, but growing up was a bit tough. Um, so that was that. And, of course, you know, the, you just go and hang out at the Mermaid and see great bands and meet interesting people, you know. Yeah, I love that part in your book when you tell your dad that, that you're, you're quitting the job, you're quitting the job, you're, go, you're going on the dole, and I'm, I'm going to hang out with some friends. Well, I mean, I think, I think you know, later on he, was, he became quite proud of Yes what Napalm Death did, but I mean, at the time, I wasn't even going to join the band. I was just going to hang out with the drummer. That's what, that's what that could kill him. He was like, what? Right. And I, and I said, well, it's, you know, it'll work. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know it was going to work out. I just, you, you just do what you do because you're young and crazy, I suppose, you know. Well, you, you, you followed your heart. Could, could you tell us how, um, 
how did you how did you how did you join Napalm Death? How did that come about? What were the circumstances? And and how did you how did you get the call, so to speak? Well, originally because uh, they'd already done the A side of Scum. You know, I was there with the guys when they recorded that. It was an overnight recording, very strange. And Justin had uh, the offer to join the band called Head of David on drums. Mm. So they, that was that. And then Nick said, do you want to play guitar for Nate Bongeth? This was in the late 86. And I said yes, but I think I was pretty nervous about it all. And I had some songs already that appeared on from Enslavement to Obliteration. But because of, this is pre-internet, I said yes, and I kind of disappeared back home to Brosley. Christmas time came, and we sort of lost uh, contact a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think Mickey just decided that it wasn't happening, happening with me, which is probably right. I was nervous. And then uh, Bill came into the band on guitar for the B-side of Scum. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, now, now when, when you mention that record, from what I understand, side A and side B are really quite different, correct? To me, they are. There's two. It's, it's different lineups. I mean, I personally prefer yeah. the A side. Sure. It was a really, a really cool blend of like Celtic Frost metals with with Siege fast hardcore. It's a really good blend. B side's a little bit more manic. I mean, people love the B side too. That's fine. Yeah. I really love the A side. That was what I fell in love with when I joined right. Nate. That, well, when I saw Nate Bomb. So that album came out, uh, and then the bass player. Jimmy left for I'm not sure what reasons exactly, um, and so they so we need a bass need a bass player. And I felt I think I felt more comfortable jumping in on bass than guitar, you know, at that yeah. time. Uh, I didn't want to miss my chance. Didn't want to miss my chance again. So uh, right. Nikki said, you, "Are you are you up for it definitely this time?" I'm like, "Yes, I am." So it's it, it's rare in life that the memory go around comes around a second time, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I I, I don't. I, yeah, I, I I can play guitar better, obviously better than I could back then. But sure. I had a step in I had a step in playing guitar for brewery brew here for a while, and it made me nervous. I don't know why. I like play. I can record at home, but live, not not a big not a big fan. Uh-huh. So bass is more my thing, I guess. Eventually, and it became more my thing, and uh, that was that really. So yeah. Is all right. No, it just says only Mick Harris is the drummer on both sides of that. Uh, and he's actually not even the original drummer, so there's the crazy thing there. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this, but just looking at the Napalm Death timeline, there was a lot of moving pieces early on, but then, but then, really, since like '91, things pretty much settled down, and, and you guys have had a pretty, you know, longevity with with members. You know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, it was just, I think, in the sort of 87 to 89 period, we were quite young, you know, yeah. probably immature. And uh, um, Bill had carcass. And I think Lee was getting into more slow stuff. And then we went to Japan in 89, and I think uh, it was splitting, really, you know. Um, is this that lineup that went to Japan, or was this right after? Yeah, that's the Japanese lineup, yep. That's there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not everybody. Good. Not everybody looks happy. <laughs> well, it was a strange thing back in the day because I mean, I love metal and hardcore, but and Bill was from the metal scene, but it seemed to me that Lee, Lee, when he was younger, just it was uncomfortable with the the notion of of being a frontman in some ways. Mm-hmm. And he sure. became once he joined Cathedral, he, he he became so much more confident. I felt. Mm. Um, but to me, I was like, well, yeah, I love hardcore and stuff, but I mean, I'm into like being in a band too. But I think some people are uncomfortable with being in a band. I don't know why, but there you go. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that the guys that left really went on to do you know great things. Of you know, course. They, 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 didn't, they didn't just, you know, fade away. They didn't just, you know, uh, go back home and, and, and uh, you know, get a job flipping burgers, so to speak. You know, they, they, really, they really went on to do great stuff. No, I mean, Bill, I mean, I knew Bill way before um, from the tape trading days, and he was already a really good guitar player. So mm. he had Carcass um, at the same time as Napalm. And I think Lee, Lee just wanted it. Lee was really getting into like the whole Doom, Stoner Rock stuff, you know. Um, yeah. And that, I think that's it's natural. I mean, no, I think Mickey, when he left, he, he went on to do lots of great stuff too. It's, it's kind of in your blood, really. To, but not always to do the same thing, I guess. Uh, when when you first when you first joined Napalm, 
Is it is it true it was literally right before appeal session? It was yeah, a few weeks before because that was a couple of the deciding factors. They wanted to make another album, but they had no they had no songs. I don't know. <laughs> so, I'm not sure what Bill was doing, but I had songs already from when I was asked originally. I said, right. "Well, yeah, I got a bunch. I got like eight, nine, ten songs." Right. Then you're in, then you're in kind of thing. And oh, um, you oh, you got songs? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're in. <laughs> so, I think, originally, I think, and then uh, yeah, of course, the peel session came about before I even played a show, so that was weird. We did like a couple of songs, like "Lucid Fairy Tale" and. Lines of the Truth, which were new Napalm Death songs. So at that time, so yeah, I mean, it was like straight into the BBC studios, which is quite surreal, really, for me. Um, and yeah, that was it. It was weird. Could, for, for those here in the States that, that you know, may not, could you just, in a, in a couple sentences, uh, Peel, uh, John Peel, um, who was he? What was his, what, what, what did he, what was his influence? Uh, what did he mean over there uh, in the UK? Ra uh, Radio One, BBC Radio One DJ from the old brigade, but he loved yeah. all manner of music. You know? Incredible. He, he's the sort of person that would play some sort of like uh, some African jazz and then go, you know, the most mellow music, then he'd go, and here's Nate Bomb Death. Yeah. You know? he, he'd uh, play like some obscure John Lennon shit and then play, yeah. you know. <laughs> so, he, so we would listen to him in. I grew up on another DJ called Tommy Vance, who was more heavy metal rock. But John Peel just he, he he just loved everything and really pushed different types of music with his Peel sessions. You know the yeah. curated Peel sessions, Jimi Hendrix, the Smiths, uh, the Fall. I think, Sid, of, I think Sid Barrett did one. He probably yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, they were famous. So yeah, yeah I mean, for me in, in that year, it was like they bombed Death Peel session. Then a few months later, he, he wanted Unseen Terror to do a peel session. So mm. I then went on drums to do Unseen Terror. That's when we did the Sick of It All cover. Mm. Then we went back in for a second Nate Bomb Death peel session, all in the space of like 12 months. But he was instrumental, really, in, in, in pushing Grindcore at that time to, to like not just not just metal people, but indie alternative people were, were like, oh, what's this Grindcore theme, you know? Sure. And and Pat Baldwin asked, did the Peel show grow their audience? You of course, right? It did, it did. I mean, it, for Napalm, it was that that you know, you we were playing small clubs, they went to sort of like bigger student clubs, and then of course the BBC came in and did a heavy metal documentary on us. Sure. And all these things started happening that um probably wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for John Peel, really. Sounds like a very exciting time. It was crazy for us because we were young and, and I mean, you know. Yeah. And, but you're trying to take it in your stride, not be egotistical about it, because when you're yeah. young, you're like, whoa, wow, you know. Uh, so we were trying to do that, but all these things were happening. The front cover of the NME at the yeah. time, the Independent uh, Magazine, was happening, and um, you know, I was going back to a small village to, uh, you know, to have my my friends at school who once ridiculed me, going, uh, well, you know, all of a sudden Shane and this band Napalm Death are doing really well. I'm like, well. I don't know what can I say. I'm happy. <laughs> I guess yeah. it's 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 great when actually you know you were young and you got some accolades and you were you were there and and, and you could enjoy it. You know, it, it's it doesn't always work out that way. No, no. I mean, for sure. I mean, you know, you have a little stroke of luck there. Fate, stars yep. aligning, all that kind of vibe, and that reset really the path that I'd always wanted to be on. But of course, sure. then. Once you're on it, it's where you go from there, really, I guess. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, you guys come to the U.S. in, in 89, and um, the first American show you play is at, at CBGB. It was CBGB's, and then we also organized a show with a band called Immolation, Immolation and Revenant at Streets, I believe it was, uh, which I think was, eight, I'm not sure where it was in New York, but um, yeah, the CBGB's, I never, we'd never been to the States, so we flew in. Mm -hmm. I remember King Diamond. I think King Diamond was playing the same night, I think. And then um, Nuclear Assault was playing because Dan, Danny Lilka came down to say hello because Lilka was a massive supporter of Napalm, you know. And um, But he couldn't come to the show. And so um, it was us, Prong, and Blind Idiot God played. Wow. And, um, Tommy, Vic Tommy Victor, who, who, who was the sound man at CBGB's? I believe so. That's right. Yeah, and, uh, he was. So, but we for some reason I thought we thought we were going to go on first, but it seemed like that wasn't the case. And then 
uh, Blondie Dick God were on, were on before us and they played for like, they were jamming away for like 90 minutes. And Mickey, our drummer, got upset and unplugged the guitar. Here we go. Here's the story. Right. Here's the story. You're getting it now. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, so, of course, anyway, Mickey's an eccentric character. Uh -huh. just, I love him or hate him. I love him personally. Right, right. So, you know, we're jet lagged, you know, totally tired, totally fried. I mean, New York, I'd never been to the States. I was like, God, how am I going to cross this road? It's like eight lanes. <laughs> how do I do this? I, wanted, yeah. I, wanted, I, see, I could see the store, but can I make it across there alive? Uh -huh. I, got, I got introduced. <laughs> Kevin introduced me to uh, St. Mark's Pizza, which was just down from CBGB's, which is probably the most amazing pizza ever, you know. Well, um, I, got, I got one for you. Hold on. Hold on. I got it. You gonna show it? It, it? It's all right here. Just so we have, just so, boom. St. Mark's Pizza. What's up? There you go. There it, it is. <laughs> it, it was every time we went to New York, we gotta go to St. Mark's Pizza, and it was the best pizza. I mean, I think God, you know, I think I had about five slices before we eventually played. So <laughs> I'll be blowing up. And of course, Blind Indie God just kept on playing, and Mickey has like a. Really hardcore Birmingham voice. Mickey's like Shane. I can't handle this much anymore. And he just he just unplugged the guitar player from his amp, and uh, it didn't go down very well, unfortunately. Uh, that I thought about that today. Like, it's a bold move, you know. You, I mean, it you, was, you almost you have to be ready to you have to be ready to everybody's everybody has to be ready for a, for a brawl. I mean, look, luckily, 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 it didn't get too ugly. But yeah, I mean. I feel I felt really bad. I mean, they were. I know it's their vibe for jamming, but we were like, man, it's two a.m. in the morning. Can we just oh, go sucks, on stage man. and play? You know, and uh, that sucks. So, uh, but anyway, that was that. It's an interesting tale. The guitarist was yelling at Mick, and I was kind of jet lagged, laughing. But there we go. That's it, what a glorious place that was. You know, I, it, this this made me laugh to myself. Uh, having grown up here uh, in New York City, uh, we would come down from the Bronx. We take the train down and. And we'd run amok in the village as, as young teenagers. And I remember that me and, and, and my crew, we, we ended up getting into a brawl with the guys at St. Mark's Pizza. I don't know how or why, you know, or what, what it led to, how it started. But I remember the guys in St. Mark's Pizza that worked there, you know, chasing us down the street with like, you know, with, uh, with you know, kitchen utensils. And we just made a run for it. No, no. Well, but that's New York. That's New York in the in, in the early '80s for you. I'm sure. I'm sure. But it was oh god, glorious. I've yet to find a pizza yeah. slice as superb as that. Really, and I I do look. Believe me. Uh, Ray Hogan says New Rochelle. Did you maybe that show was up in New Rochelle, New York? I think it was. Yeah, the streets. Yeah. The streets one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, oh, streets. Streets. The club was streets. Streets was in New Rochelle. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Of course, of course we didn't know what we were doing, so we. We yeah. jump in this. We jump in this this cab, and we go. Can you take us here? Of course, it's like yeah, right. And the guy's like, he's like fifty miles away. So he drove us around the block and dropped us off. Dropped us off, and we're like, oh, right. So we had a cool Ross for an emulation. Like, Ross, can you pick us up, please, if you don't mind? Can <laughs> you take us to New Rochelle? Like, where do we? You know, I mean, I mean, England's small. I mean, you go twenty miles from here, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wolverhampton. It's like. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're you, you can navigate it pretty easy. Yeah, here, yeah. But uh, in, interest, <laughs> interesting and fun experience. Really, it's an expensive cab ride, you know. Um, yeah. and any early memories of New York? What, what was it? Was it all? Was it a, uh, about coming here for the first time with the band? Was it exciting? Did you uh, any anything that you know? Uh, has New York been traditionally a special place for you? We got. Well, I have lots of fun memories because, uh, well, many memories really. I mean, uh, uh, Kevin Sharp, who sings in Venomous Concert with me. I mean, um, and also Lock Up with me. Uh, you know, he, he lived there for a while. So I think after one of the tours, it might have been the tour with Sepultura and Sick of It All. Right. I stayed in New York for about ten days, and we just, you know, I was fascinated by like, the, the blimpy and things like just simple. <laughs> Weird things, I, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Going out and you know, bleaker bobs, and you know, I'd hit that place and just buy uh, tons of t shirts, you know, and yeah, record. yeah, all that stuff was like amazing to me because you couldn't get a lot, you, you know, you were you turn up at your you go out drinking, 
after New York little run, you'd have like some ministry shirt which nobody had, or some same some shirt, and they'd where'd you get that from? Oh well, wow. Right. So it's showing off a little bit, unfortunately. But there you hey, go. do you know you know my cousin Alan Dubin? Yeah, yeah, I know. Alan, yeah, yeah, so Alan's my cousin. Oh, that's crazy. He's a drummer of uh, Roger's Pigs. Yeah. yeah he, what's that? Uh, it, yeah, I know. Alan, He's yeah. a singer. He was in uh he was in the earache band Old Old Lady Drivers. Oh, okay, old okay, I got confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think he wrote, he wrote, he sent me a message last few months ago, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, was, he, he, was he, in, he was in a band called, he was in Con 8, and now he's in a band called Noah. Uh, oh, he, he got in touch, he was, he was with uh, Jimmy Pluckin. That's he? right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Long so, time, it's been a while since I've seen him, though. Been yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned you were coming on the show, and he said, yeah, he's an old friend, you know. Yeah, we, 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 it, yeah, we had a couple of messages last year. I think I'm not, I'm not even through Facebook, I think, and you know, as, you, as, you, as you do. And you realize it's been six months since you said hello, you know. And sure. Kind of was was that um, Sepultura, Sick of It All, Sacred, uh, Sacred Reich? Uh, was, yeah, that yeah. New, was that New Titans on the block? It was, yeah, it was, yeah. It was an interesting tale. We played the Ritz in New York, and that was Danny's only, Danny Herrera's second only show. Wow. So it was, uh, it was, it was interesting. He really he, he threw him into the fire with that one, really. Yeah. <laughs> Battle, Battlefield Commission, as as, as they yeah, say. Pretty right? much. Yeah. yeah. Hey, let me take a let me take a quick sponsor break. Uh, play a couple commercials, and uh, let's come back and let's talk about Harmony uh, Corruption and, and and recording in Tampa with Scott Burns, and and we'll move forward from there. Okay. Sure. Yeah. See you in a minute. And now a word from our sponsors. Peace, what it do? Welcome to NYT Comics at 117 Main Street, Dobbs, Surrey, New York. I'm Debo the Pro with my homie. Lee Farley. Welcome to the spot. Oh, Specializing in yesterday's and today's comic books, rare CGCs, toys, collectibles, uh, skateboards, old school tapes, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer, video games, original art, original art pieces by your favorite New York City and worldwide artists. Let's go! Skate decks all day, baby! We also have the young reader section here for like 10, 10 and under. Uh, the pops, people love the pops. Star Wars! <laughs> we are New York hardcore, we always rep the scene. Let's get it off! Guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on West 3rd Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The so place is bigger, kitchen is bigger, we have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do, and we are happy to see you guys. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com. Follow them on Facebook and Instagram. And we're back. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Want to remind everybody, a couple shows coming up this Wednesday, co-hosted by Howie Abrams, Ill Bill will be on the show. This will be a good one. A uh, week from today, October 8th, Leeway the Forgotten Ones documentary will have guitar player Michael Gibbons on the show. Trevor Moman from American Werewolves on Sunday, October 15th. J.R. Roach of Sam Black Church, Sunday, October 22nd, and Sunday, November 5th, Giz Butt from English Dogs, Prodigy, Janice Stark, and The Destructors. So that said, um, just want to remind everybody the show could use your support. Please join Patreon. 
Don't be a Patreon. Join Patreon. All pay all patrons out there, by the way, the book is out. All patrons get the book for free. Just came out. Ships the next day. Uh, it is the companion to uh, night, volume one, 1980 to 1989. The new book, 1990 to 1999, is now out. Uh, if you're not a patron, for some crazy, bizarre reason, uh, the book is available at www.stonefilmsnyc.com. So get up, get out, make it happen. Uh, thank you. Yeah, the book is out. Making a lot of trips to the post office. Buy the book. Support the show. Make it happen. Let's bring our guest, Shane, back on. Hey, man. Hey. Hey. So, here we go. Oh, yeah. Where were we? Um, you went down to Florida to, to, uh, to record uh, Harmony Corruption. And uh, I, I thought it was interesting that in your own word, in your own quote, you sort of, you know, uh, said that it's sort of known as uh, Napalm's death metal album. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> the band's always been into uh, death metal. Um, mm -hmm. I think at that point, for sure, Barney had just joined, uh, you know, Liam Bill, Bill had left, Jesse and Mitch had joined, they came over from the States. Um, and so it was just, I can't even remember whose idea it was. It might have been Digby's from Earaches, it might have been Mickey's. Because we were listening to a lot of death metal at that point, we thought we'd just go to Florida and uh, record the album there. Um, and so, but musically, it's kind of similar to, similar to Heart, to uh, Mentally Murdered, but of course, we tuned the guitars up, and Scott Bourne, Scott Burns produced it, so it had a had more of a Florida death metal sound, really. I think so. It kind of um, it, it gained new fans, but also older fans were kind of a bit pissed off, you know. Yeah. Um. So it was quite a divisive album. Strange record, really. You know. Um. I mean, I had a lot of fun over there. Again, I'd never really been to the states, you know. So we were kind of. We were hanging out with Morbid Angel and Obituary and all that kind of stuff whilst recording the record. Um, I think because Barney, Mitch, and Jesse had just joined, it was a they were finding their feet still, you know. But um, it's probably a, it's a very important album for the Napalm Death over in um, the states, well, everywhere. I think really it was probably um, unless you were underground, you, you didn't know too much about Napalm. So Harmony Corruption, I guess, put the band. Mm -hmm map over in america maybe but um i think it is, this is, i think this is from that from that time right yeah that's correct that will be at the hotel where we were staying probably yeah yeah that's right and and, um, and that that was that's that's tampa right yeah the studio was in tampa but we were staying over in i think like st petersburg across the bridge so we hadn't really planned that one out so it's quite a long long yeah yeah there. Yeah, uh, and again, being English, not really understanding the distance concept of. Uh, <laughs> um, so that was that, but it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was kind of stressful for Mickey, I think, for some reasons. But um, yeah, we had a good time, and I mean, I liked it myself. But I think it was a strange. It was a strange record. I mean, I'm glad we did it. I wouldn't really want to change anything at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you see, when you, when you go so many years ahead, you can look back at these. Sure. these at the time, you, it, it was kind of stressful how it was perceived. But like twenty years on, you can look back and go, "Oh well, you know, it was a necessary step, I guess." What well, one thing that I gleaned from from the book is Napalm Death uh, and and shifted uh, uh, shifted uh, constantly. And even early on, there was a lot of sort of um, let's use the term. How can I say it lightly? You know, people kind of moaning about they changed and this and that, or they sold out. And and my feeling was early on, you 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 sort of arrived at that. You know what? People are gonna people are gonna fucking carry on regardless. What matters is I I need to do what 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 makes me feel right and and with this band and artistically. And and it, I need to do what I need to do, and if people can follow, they can follow. We're not going to repeat ourselves. Is that is that a fair assumption to make? Well, certainly, when uh, you know, 
at one point this very house there was there was me jesse mitch danny living together constantly you know so we were going we would record we would tour we would come home and we we didn't leave each other his company for for years so it was it was, it was a we were a family you know yeah. for sure and uh we discussed music. We listened to similar things. You know, if I liked a particular band, that the other guys would get into it, and vice versa. So we we would rehearse. We'd rehearse. We'd have a few beers afterwards. Come back home. We'd discuss what we were doing. And so to us, it was just all natural progressions. Yeah. But also, we were young, so you so, you know you would take a comment more seriously than you should have taken it, possibly. You know. Sure. But we still kept on doing what we were doing. I mean. People say, "Oh, yeah, you don't sell this record." Yeah, I mean, it wasn't. A, it wasn't like. I mean, I, I noticed over the past 10, 15 years, the albums are still crazy, but the production changes just because our, our producer who works with us gets better at his job. Mm -hmm. so things just change, and sometimes you, it's, it's it's an unconscious change, but necessary. And people will get all bent out of shape about it, but we we're like, "Well, we're just following our heart." You know, if we do the same thing over and over, that's boring to us. You know. And um, some people got it, some people didn't. And then 20 years later, I mean, some of the, the mid-90s albums got kind of slated but are now kind of revered as, like, innovative records. So it, what does that say? I don't know. You know. Yeah, it's interesting how the passage of time when, when you know, in, per, in, in perspective, how things, how things change. Records that – records and, and recordings that were sort of panned in the moment now or, or, or looked back upon as – Sort of watershed iconic moments, so you know. You I, mean, to, I, mean, to, I mean, to us, we you know we we were, we were fortunate. I mean, I mean, for me, yeah. from from a small small village, you know, I have my sister. Yeah, but um, uh, they became they are my brothers. They were they were my family and are my family, and so we we lived and breathed it every day. You know what we were yeah. doing. And there's a great scene in Birmingham. Different kinds of music every other day. There's different bands playing. So we were loving it. We were just rehearsing during the day, recording here and there, going to see James Addiction one night or Sonic Youth or Fave No More or all the punk metal bands are playing and have death metal bands are playing. So for us, it was massively exciting. And we were thriving off all that, really. You know. I like, uh, by the way, our friend and supporter, Chris Canto, says what's up. Hey, Chris. So, how's that... Uh... How are those shows going out there, Chris? Um, people are mentioning, yeah, I, I want to touch on that. Uh, the album that Shane uh, did with Lou Kohler was intense. Yeah. Could, could you tell us about uh, that project and, and, and how Lou came, uh, came in? I know you resurrected it later on, but how did it initially come together with Lou? Well, I think, um, you know, um, you're doing the, we're doing the napalm thing. And me and Mitch particularly are quite itchy creatives you know like, oh, yeah, I, yeah. Wanted, I was getting into I don't know, Sonic Youth, Helmet um, all this other stuff and I guess and I kind of had this idea I wanted to do my kind of solo album I guess whatever <laughs> uh, you know and I did the music and I just couldn't think of I mean at one point I asked Mike from Faith No More if he would sing on it and he was like he, was, he seemed like he was into it but then didn't and yeah. then whichever and uh and then uh, our old manager said, well, you're kind of missing the obvious choice. And I said, well, who's that? I said, we should ask Lou. I said, oh, God, yeah. There you go. So I asked Lou. I think, I'm not sure if they were on, they might have been on tour. I think they'd finished the last show in London and he came over and, and actually, yeah, he stopped in this very room for a few days. He said, this used to be my old bedroom back in the day before I got married. And, um, so, yeah, he stopped here. And then... Um, we, we just kind of jumped into it, you know. I mean, we should have had more preparation, you know, really. I know Lou always, I remember Lou always told me that I think he liked, always liked Armin to be there to help him, you know. Yeah. Um. So, but we did it and, you know, it, it's one of those kind of albums that was kind of had a cult following, you know. I mean, I was really happy with it and Lou seemed happy with it and it just kind of, that was that. It, it just stayed there forever. And, mm. and I did have some other ideas and I think some of, the, some of those other riffs, that I had actually became ideas on the, the inside of the time of torn apart album. Songs like Section were actually originally for a second Blood from the Soul album, but never materialized until years and years later. So that was with Lou. And then it was Dirk Verboyeren who plays in Megadeth then, who's a longtime friend of mine. He's a massive Blood from the Soul fan. And he kept on saying, You want to do something? I'm like, Well, I've really thought about it. 
really. And then eventually I had some stuff for another project, which didn't really happen. And at least could work for a second Blood from the Soul album. Right, right. And I remember from talking to Jacob from Converge years ago. One of the we didn't talk very much, me and Jacob. He's got a quiet guy. I remember him saying he always asks, he was already like that Blood from the Soul album. Oh, you like that album. And for some reason, me and Lou, I don't know, we we're best of friends, but I don't know, we weren't communicating as because Lou said, oh, I, I would have sang on it. I said, well, I kind of asked you before, but you always seem busy. And, yeah, you know, that's tough. Yeah. And, that's, and then, then so then Jacob sang on it, and then he kind of took took it, took the concept. He, he did a whole bunch of lyrics and stuff, which was cool because I didn't really want to write, write lyrics, and here we are with the second one. But it wasn't really planned at first, you know. Do you write a lot of lyrics? Do, 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 does that does that is that something that that, uh, that, that you, you need to do often? Um, I wrote a lot of lyrics for the first album, and I have, I do write lyrics for Napalm. Mm -hmm. um, not as many. Napalm te tends to write the majority, but I have other projects where I write a lot of the lyrics. Um, I have another project I've just finished, which is very different musically from anything I've ever done. And I, I actually sing sing on this, but I haven't. Oh boy! I haven't. I haven't decided, oh boy. <laughs> decided a name for that project as yet, but right. Um, that's been bubbling under for a few months now, but um, I do like to write lyrics. I tend to get a bit kind of philosophical and spiritual with my my wordings, I suppose. If that bet dare I say it, but there you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to, uh, you, you know, in, in in the in the in the book, you talk about some some other band. Oh, now I want to mention, uh, hey Scott Lewis. In about 20 minutes, we're going to take another break, and then we're going to do questions. So everybody that has, like, questions and stuff from around the world, hang on to those, and you'll repost them, and we'll do it. We're going to do it. We're going to field a lot of questions a little bit in a little bit. Um, one thing one thing I really um, enjoyed in the book is you, you talking about your love peripherally for, for a lot of other uh, music, uh, music genres. Uh, you talked about Smashing Pumpkins, Faith No, Faith no More. Uh, even Nirvana. Um, I thought it was great that that you know uh, you these are bands you loved and 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 you unabashingly uh, you know a lot of times people say yeah they don't want it you know but it's great that, that you love these bands and you went out and saw these bands and and could you tell us a little bit how you, you connected with Billy Gould right? Yeah, um, you know in, in the nineties it was as I say a thriving scene in Birmingham. We're always out watching different bands. I always loved, I, I like to explore music really. And Mitch Dickinson's brother Paul, he had the second Faith No More album. So he said, Check this band out. And I really, really like this, this album, this band Faith No More. And then when the real thing was about to come out, I was going, Mike Patton, isn't that the guy from Mr. Bungle? Okay, all right. So I got, I got the record. Uh, uh, excuse me, the, the first Faith No More record being Chuck. Yeah. Chuck Chuck Mosley, Chuck Chuck Mosley. Mosley, right? And he had they did, um, they had that, uh, it, what was that? They had that, we care a lot, yeah, we care. That was the one that was always at the clubs, and that's uh, right, that's right. Yep. So, um, when the third album came out, I loved that. I went to see him at a small club in Birmingham, which is not there anymore. And I heard these kind of rumors that they, 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 the guys like Napalm too. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, didn't think anything about it, uh huh. As such, and then they played Nottingham and they did like an in store. And I thought, well, I'm gonna go say hello during the day. And then um, I went down and met Billy. Billy just sort of came from behind the desk sign in and we shook hands. And I took him, Mike, and Jim up to the earache office to get them, you know, hooked up with shirts and records. And me and Billy just became really good friends after that. And through Billy, I met uh, Brujo, which is the singer of Brujeria, because they went. They what? Juan Brujo. Juan Brujo, so because they went to high school together. Yeah. So that's the crazy thing there. Um, yeah. So this is another connection that happened, and uh, and then I became an honorary member of Brujeria. So it was a, uh, you know, strange thing. But Billy's great. He's totally down to earth and always up for collaborating and advice and just really nice chat. When you see him, he's in really nice chats. And, and of course, I, I loved Faith No More, so I was like, well, wow, this is quite – Bizarre, but great. And 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 he he was sort of he sort of steered you to the Nazi punks fuck off track. Yeah, he, he got in touch. He's like, you know, there's a there's the alternative Teddy Girls hundredth release or, or something. I, right, like that. right. And 
He said, do you like dead Kennedys? I said, well, of course you like dead Kennedys. Said, well, oh, yeah. And, uh, and he said, well, uh, Jello, I think, I'm not sure it was his idea or Jello's, would you like to do Nazi punks? I'm like, sure. Why not? They'll do that. And uh, we recorded it at the studio. We did the Blood from the Soul album right before we went on tour in Europe with Death and Cannibal Corpse. Like, well, I say tour, it was like five or six shows. So we just finished that. And Nazi punks has become the kind of anthem, so to speak, you know, that it is. Um, and we changed it a little bit because if you listen to the beginning, it starts slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, but that's actually the drum beats ripped off the mountain song by Jane's Addiction. So there you go. And we just uh, we just took a riff that it is and slowed it down and kind of kind of made a little sort of tribal dance part before we launch off into the chaos. Um, but it, it's one of those songs that we have to play live now, I guess, pretty much. You know, I love I love the bit when you talk about going to Mexico with Brujeria. Yeah, it's pretty insane. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty nuts. I mean, that's uh, like. Holy we're, 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 a little, we're a little calmer now because we're getting a little bit older, you know, but uh, yeah. there's some insanity down there. Yeah, for sure. It was great. I love it down there. It's uh, always yeah. great people, great food, great times, you know. Do, do you do you still play in uh, Brujeria from time to time? Uh, we, I do. Uh, we just had the new album that just came out on um, Nuclear, uh, the new, which came out like, what, two weeks ago? Actually, last week, maybe. Um mm -hmm. I took a while for it to come together, but uh, I I play with them when I can, really. Yeah. Because they they really you know, they're constantly touring, and I'm busy with Napalm. Yeah. I'm sure. trying to balance the reality versus the non-reality, but uh, I do like to play over here. Uh, the doors are open when it when I can, you know. Our uh, our good friend and supporter Jessica uh, is uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're, and she's actually she's actually uh, in in this book. You know, she was in a New York hardcore band early on, and uh, we uh, we like Jessica a lot. So yeah, she's great, 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 yeah. great, voice, great voice. Yeah. Chris says the new Brujeria album is very true to form. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it kind of nails the. Uh, the earlier kind of attitude as well, the new one. You know, it makes me laugh. It's always if it makes you laugh, it's a good, good thing. <laughs> and some certain parts on there that make me laugh, and that was what Brewery is good for. Us besides it being brutal and you know, and and stuff. But I'm glad it's it's out. And the guys, I think the guys are doing a tour in November in the states. Brewery came out of the box strong with that that first record. <laughs> With the with that graphic yeah, on the yeah. cover, it was like, "What the fuck is this?" You know. Well, at the time, it was meant to be a kind of a secret, really. Yeah. And then they're uh, they're drug, they're drug cool. cartel members. Yeah, that's what they said. And then and then, and then Dino came, Dino from Fear Factory came over and told everybody, and blew it, blew the he blew the lid off it. And, um, <laughs> that was it. But um, yeah. it was still it's, it's still people still think other people played in there, which they didn't. So you keep them guessing if you can. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought I thought um, was an interesting part of the book uh, when when you talked about sort of like the mid '90s being uh, like a, a bit of a sticky patch for for Napalm Death and uh, with the Diatribes album and and then this asking Barney to leave and then him coming back a couple months later. Could you give us a little perspective on, on like those years there and, and kind of how it went down? Well, I think, um, you know, of course, this is only from my perspective and what I remember. Um, around about 93, we'd done, we played South America, uh, South Africa, actually. And then uh, we started writing the new songs, and me and Mitch predominantly probably had an idea of how we wanted to concentrate on the slower stuff, well, mid paced stuff. Barney moved to London, so we were kind of out of the loop. We didn't see each other as much. Yeah. So we would just carry on practicing. I think Barney was unaware of what we were doing musically. He was doing a lot of journalism, uh, and I think we just did, we we split. We just weren't, we weren't as close as we used to be, and that mm -hmm. kind of carried on through a couple of the albums. Really, um, he didn't. See, I mean, Barn didn't see him. Like, I think Barn at one point wanted to leave anyway around Fear of Emptiness, um, but didn't. Um, and then uh, immaturity, you know, not communicating. Sure. That's the worst right. thing is not talking, really. Of course. Sometimes it's not it's not as bad as you you ever perceive it to be. It's just about opening your mouth and saying, "Hey, remember when we were young and we didn't give a shit," you know. Um, and so that was that. And then it, uh, it was just got to a point where I think he realized he was 
well, he realized that we were not communicating. I think at that point, it was just like, well, now it's too late. And so he went, uh, depending on which perspective you look at him, he left, we kicked him out, whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, and it's just like, well, then we got Phil in from Extreme Most Terror for a little bit. Right. And then started working on Inside Tone the Park, Inside the Tone the Park. Yep. But then Phil, Phil didn't really have what, I mean, Phil's an amazing, lovely guy. And bless him. And he's not here now, unfortunately. But um, uh, it wasn't Barney, you know? Yeah. And so I had to kind of break the news to Phil and I had to sit down with Barney. And Barney was like, oh, I was kind of just getting used to it. <laughs> Alex to this, I my mind you know. And so he, he, he listened to the record. He's all, well, it's a heavy record. I'm like, what the fucking hell do you think we're going to do? Yeah. You, know? you think we're doing ballads? <laughs> you know, it's, 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 and so, again, just that immaturity and lack of communication from sure. both sides, really. Um, so he came in and there we go, you know. Um, it, it, see, it seems that it, it really revitalized the band a bit when he came back. Well, I think, you know, I mean, me and Barn are incredibly stubborn with each other. You know, he says that in the book, and I, I mean, you know, he, he could have probably said far worse, to be fair. And um, sure. but uh, but um, we are stubborn. I mean, and perhaps you know, a lot of a few of my friends say that's what makes it tick: the fact that you're kind of rubbing against each other. That's right. That's I mean, right. we're friends, of course, we are. We are brothers. We've been friends forever. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's times when we're pretty much at each other. You know, we want the best. Of course, but it's different perspectives. And of course, sometimes you're so close, but then so, so far, really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, 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 it helped. I mean, we, that, that, that definitely helped coming back in and we, you know, we were full steam ahead. Then we had a little bit of a, a low moment uh, again uh, before we did any of the music business, I suppose, you know. You've had an incredibly long and um, proficient relationship with him all these years you've done so many so much touring and recording it's a long time it's a lot you know it is i mean it's um well yeah and and, uh, and i think that's the thing when starting the book was weird because all of a sudden you realize that yeah. you know at that point i'd been in the band 35 years it's like well, wow. dear, where, where did that go you know yeah was was there just look looking at the book was was there was there any part of it that was like difficult for you to to put out there that that was uncomfortable? Um, that, yeah, I don't know if it's uncomfortable, but I mean, you know, we we touch upon uh, the, the, the you know the death of Jesse. It was, yeah, it, it yeah. was uh, our get lung the guitarist and also obviously our friend brother. I used to, I mean, before he joined Napalm when he was in Terrorize, I used to. I didn't know the time difference. I used to wake him up at four in the morning in Los Angeles, calling him, you know, yeah. like day trading. And um, that was kind of tough because um, past few years have been a bit weird. And I, and I think when you when people pass away that are close to you, it's um, how do you deal with it? Do you deal with it then, or does it just take a, a while for it to kick in? And of course, during the book, my mom passed away, ah. so that was kind of kind of very difficult for me to and still is really um uh to deal with because you realize that it means my sister you realize you kind of i hate to say it but you realize you're sort of orphans in a way it's kind of crazy yeah. you know? um but um so yeah i mean that was it's not it's it, i just tried to talk about it as best i could i i i'd like to think that there's some funny stories in there i suppose but also uh you get to see other sides of uh what my life has been really yeah uh, just anybody out there watching that's wondering, uh, pick up the book, uh, www.napalmdeathbook.com. It's a great read. I can, I can testify to that. Uh, pick it up and, and, and have a go at it. Um, yeah, the, the, the Jesse thing was, was sad, you know, because I think, uh, you know, I could relate to that, you know, being in the, you know, uh, in bands and around musicians my whole life, my whole adult life, you know. Uh, and, and I quote, you said, you know, he just couldn't turn it off. And, you know, I know that person, you know, uh, I've had that person in my life and it's, uh, it's very sad. Well, uh, this is the, uh, the craziness of the, uh, the times it can be a circus. I mean, being honestly about myself, when I joined Napalm, I never drank at all, but there's a lot of downtime on, on touring and you can, it's very yeah. easy just to reach and, you know, and when you're young and it, 
and of late, I, you know, I, I certainly got a little bit ill recently. I, st I stopped drinking with about 10 years, picked it up again quickly, then put it down again, made myself <laughs> ill. Um, and not good, not clever. And you go, well, why are you doing these things? And it's really trying to separate your, how you are in a band with your real life at home. It's, you wear right. masks, you know. And the thing is, you have to try and take that mask off when you get home. It's like, hey, you know, you can't be 24-7. It's, 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 it's just not good for you at all. Um, so that was that, really. <laughs> I can't imagine. I, I, I haven't uh, I haven't drank and, and drugged in fifteen years now, and uh, it, it it the thought of of revving that machine back up again is, is pretty terrifying. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, I I certainly I stopped drinking for a long time, and um, you know, you, you always like to say that you haven't got a problem. Uh, so, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, but, but at one point I was like kind of touring with Napalm Death, Brewery, Lock Up. Then I was guesting some other band, you know, and oh, I only drink on tour. Oh, yeah, but hold on a minute, Shane. You're on tour nine months of the year. And then you go and then you're coming home to deal with stuff. And yeah, you know, so sure. And unfortunately, unfortunately with Jess, it was, you know, there was there was all, all other factors going on, really. But, you yeah. know, you, it was a shame. And uh, I had to watch it. So, yeah. Um, we'll take questions a little later, but let's take this one. Extreme Noise Videos ask, did you record anything with Phil Vane? Um, you know what? There might be some stuff at the Earache Vaults. Mm. With uh, like early, very, I know I know he sang on "Breathe to Breathe." Uh, it would be nice to see if that version still exists. It may well yeah. be, you know, but uh, not too much, really, unfortunately. Yeah, um, going down the line a little bit, the last album for Earache, uh, "Words uh, Words from the Exit Wound." Uh, in retrospect, your relation with Earache, uh, can you give us some perspective on that? Um, I think really. We had a manager who, who was actually at that point going through a very big midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. wasn't really dealing with the uh, with the band's business too well, and was kind of, kind of like I think he, he might have even been floating. I don't know, Robin. We have a saying, Robin Peter to pay Paul, you know. Sure. And um, so that wasn't doing us any favors with his relations with Earache, and of course we were taking the brunt of that. And then getting crazy at the record label when there's this three-way thing going on. And I think uh, at that point, I think, I mean, we, I think we signed it. At the time of Omni Corruption, we probably signed a ridiculously long record deal, which no band would do now. I don't oh, you, oh you, you, you signed that record deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we did that. And to be fair, the manager at that point said, don't do this. And we were kind of like guided by one individual, which I won't say who that was, but. So we did it. You didn't think about it. And of course, by of course, we we you last a duration. By the time words came in, because of the scene at that point, I think record sales weren't as good. But of course, the label was chilling out some money, and it was like wasn't really working out financially there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were just doing our thing. Not yeah. I mean, we've become a lot more self uh, self conscious of of the business side. That's the thing. When you start playing music, you just play music. Sure. You don't think of business. But over the years, you start to learn that it, unfortunately, is that as well. You know, you 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 make all the mistakes twice, and then it gets to the point where you 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 realize you you have to be a little more attentive to these. Yeah, you have to, yeah. And, and, and and so and yeah, and I'm still constantly learning as I speak. Yeah. But uh, you get to you get to be able to go. Well, no, I'm not really into doing that anymore. Um, and uh, but I also I, I had a small record label for a while, and I realized I you know just from my limited experience in which. It could be very difficult. So I don't I don't think of hearing too harshly in hindsight because I can also imagine that uh, we were probably we were, we weren't probably the easiest to deal with at that point either. I don't think. Yeah, and and earache has you know you hear a lot of disgruntled you know musicians when it comes to earache. So you know it, it's it, it's interesting to hear a little bit different perspective a little bit of a realistic perspective you know well you know it takes two to tango as they say yeah absolutely i i i, I agree with you on that um uh, let's uh you know another thing um talk about kevin sharp uh, and, and i and, and and i quote from the book and and that sort of that sort of instigated me to wear the zappa shirt today but uh Kevin Sharp saw a lot of similarities between Frank Zappa and Shane because of the need to constantly keep busy and jump from one project to another. Um, work ethic. Can you can you give us 
you know, and, and and that reminded me of that reminded me of of this. Now, th- th- this uh, let me let me play this clip. I thought that this was a really interesting clip. Uh, it just it just sort of led led me there uh, about work ethic. Let me see where it is. Um, here you go. It's Rick Rubin talking about uh, there. There are a lot of talented people who never make it because they don't have the work ethic to make it. So yeah. it's not just talent. Like talent's a piece. Yeah. And I mean, you could argue for some people the work ethic trumps the talent. You know. Now I'm not. I'm. I'm, I'm certainly not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that uh, the talent's not there, but I thought there was interesting, and and because what Kevin was referring to was just your incredible work ethic, and then and then I heard uh, Rick Rubin talk about that. Uh, could you give us a little perspective on your work ethic? Um, well, I mean, I, I don't want to veer off uh, on tangents, but I think uh, probably around 10, 15 years ago, something clicked in me where I wanted to. Uh, Napalm Death's obviously been important to me, but. I wanted to be something outside of Napalm too, creatively. And then um, because I, I I love lots of different music and I just can't help thinking about, oh, I'd like to try something like this or something like that. And then recently, the past few years, I got my little home studio. You see my synthesizers here and whatever. Mm-hmm. So I've started to get into stuff I, I loved when I was a kid, which is like soundtracks and things like that. And mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's, it's quite feverish at times. I mean, I will wake up at 3, 4 in the morning creatively thinking of something my little boy sometimes sleeps next next to me and i tried to disturb him and i was instantly on the phone writing ideas then and um record little riffs here and there for various projects i mean the tronos um album i did a few we you know we have like i have like about an hour maybe 70 minutes worth of music we haven't finished yet for that and this other project i've got a dark sky barrel I, i'd probably make albums every two months because the nature of that is um abstract and underground and and, and niche um but yeah I, um yeah it's a bit of a more than a hobby it's uh yeah. it's it, i just uh you know i'm in the napalm i have multitudes of ideas for the next napalm album and uh i just yeah i, I can just come I can sometimes just sit here and i like, oh, oh i must grab a guitar Either record it on the laptop or just sometimes just acoustically on my iPhone. I've got like videos and videos of stuff and um, it's kind of how I, how I roll, I suppose, you know, I guess. Make It makes sense to me, you know, I, I, I do the sometimes. same thing. I do the same thing, I, you know, making films, putting out books, doing the show, being in a band. I mean, you well, know, uh, the, I think- the, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I think, I think when you're a creative, which you are, uh, you know, we all are artists, poets. It's not something you can switch off. It, 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 you have to do it. You don't have a choice. Yeah, I don't, you don't have a choice. Yeah, abs- absolutely. Um, let's take a break, quick break, shorter break, and then we'll come back and we'll take some questions from around the world. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. This is it. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by blah 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 and upstate records they're a new york based diy independent metal and hardcore label founded in 2017 they broke into the scene with their inaugural 26 band compilation and since then have churned out over 80 releases in their brief five-year history out now are new releases by mark rizzo's band revenge beast carl from earth crisis is fryer fury of five angry corpses with a few more surprises in the works Check them out and a whole lot more at www.upstaterecordsnewyork.com and use the code STONE10 for 10% off. Last but not least, come on now, Joe Romini, Vinny Stigma's cousin, the Texas Silver Rush. They're a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in work with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces as well as the style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers, Greg Rowley, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www.texassilverrush.com. Questions you may have for today's guest, please post them now. Go deep, get weird. Uh, just a quick reminder, the book is out. 
You can pick it up at www.stonefilmsnyc.com. It, I will sign it. They're all numbered. It's the, it's, they're all numbered. I will sign it for you or your loved one. Also, I see we got a patron in the middle of the show. I want to welcome Christopher Hoffman. Are you a patron already, bro? We need everyone goes around the merry-go-round with this thing. Welcome back, bro. <laughs> I appreciate it. That said, please join Patreon. Um, support the show. There's a, there's a super chat function. If you if you have a burning desire question for our guest today, please um, do the super chat thing. It comes through in color. I can't miss it. You go right to the front of the line. If you're watching the film in in rerun on YouTube, please subscribe. Uh, right there, so you get show alerts. And if you have a communication device, which I'm sure you do in this day and age, please follow us on Instagram at stonefilmsnyc.com. That said, post up your questions. Uh, let's go. Let's bring Shane back on. Buddy, let's see what we got. Let's see. Hold on. Let's see what we got. Uh, Okay. Not a question. Gary Rigby says, hey, from Liverpool, UK, saw Napalm Death a lot back in the day. I'm sure you did. Yeah. Was that was it, I mean, I assume early on, like that 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 UK circuit existed. You'd get you'd get in the van and just go all over the UK. Uh, to some extent, yeah. I mean the the old venue in Liverpool was a place called Planet X. That's where mm -hmm. we used to play quite a bit in the eighties. Uh, and um since then, it's varied, really. But, yeah, you know, I mean, especially in the earlier days, you were just kind of, you know, there wasn't really too many promoters at such. It was always friends of friends who would put gigs on, you know. And, sure. uh, potluck whether you got paid anything, really. But there you go. You know, I, I got it in my – oh, in my notes, listening to it. Utopia Banished sounds like half of the New York hardcore bands that I see these days. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know – I swear to God, I was listening to it and going, "Fucking!" I think I saw five bands that 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 use this as a uh, whether they, whether they know it or not. This is their template. It's incredible. That's a strange thing, but uh, yeah, well, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John in London says, "Who designed the Napalm logo?" Uh, the one you see is designed by Jeff Walker of Carcass. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's been so kind enough to let us use it all these years. I think it was, it went through a few transitions in the early days, but uh, was then redrawn by Jeff. I forget because Jeff did the, he drew the artwork for Scum, the first album cover. Sure. Uh, Mike LaRoche, uh, what gear are you currently using? Let, let, let's sort of let's let's sort of whittle it down. What what gear are you using with Napalm these days? I've been playing a Warwick Stage 2 streamer, four-string bass, for about 30 years. Um, and then I go through – well, I split the single signal at live. I have a clean signal and a distorted signal. I use a guitar, a GT2 Sansan distortion. So you get the clean sound, and you'll get that horrible, nasty, growling tiger sound, and you mix the two together. Um, and amp-wise, probably amp SVT of various descriptions, you know. Yeah, the uh, one of my former bandmates designed the Sans amp bass driver. That's great. That's, great. That's yeah. a great one. Yeah, I like to, yeah. I, I like to use the guitar one because it's actually more distorted. Yeah, and so I kind of mix the two. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, it took me a while to sort of get my head around that because in the old days you would you know you didn't know these things, so you put the distortion pedal on the bass, but then of course the bass would would just disappear. Yeah, and, and so that's, right. you got to you got to split that signal really. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, Doug Masters asks, where would you rank Enemy of the Music Business in your extensive catalog? That is my favorite Napalm record. Um, if it's Napalm Death Catalog, I'd probably say it's probably around uh, number three for me. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Um, let's see. Was there any skateboarding and graffiti there in the early 80s? Um, you had graffiti uh, around yeah. Birmingham uh, for sure, and there was skateboarding that was popular. I, I mean, I, I I barely walk myself. I, I wouldn't jump yeah. on a skateboard to save my life. <laughs> but uh, a lot of my friends did for sure. I mean, especially when the 
crossover thing came in because, you know, a lot of uh, the punks over here were influenced by suicidal and stuff like that, you know, yeah. so they, they, they got that, you know, they loved that. Sure. Um, Robert Hogg in Scotland. First time I saw Napalm Death was 1988 in the Edinburgh venue, RCBGB. Godflesh supporting was Godflesh supporting was still in high school, still one of the craziest gigs I've been to. Any memories of the venue? I remember the Edinburgh, yeah. We uh, we played there two or three times. When Barney wasn't in the band, he came down with us. And shall I say this? Oh, well, we stopped at this guy's house afterwards. It was a squat place, and uh, <laughs> he had a lot of cats. Let's just say Barney woke up with a little bit of something in his hair. Let me say Oof. But so there you go, classic punk gigs back in the day. Yeah. Early on, when you went out early on, was there a lot of? Did you play squ like squats and and uh, yeah? Yeah, I mean, a few in England, certainly in Europe, we played some some crazy squats because they were kind of all they were all, always organised by friends. Um, yeah. And there was really in in the late eighties in Europe for 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 I mean, for, there was a hardcore scene for sure. Of course, there was. I remember touring over there with Heresy a few times, and it was just friends, you know, it was a network of friends, you know, organizing shows. Yeah, yeah. And so it would vary. I mean, you were always taken care of, but sometimes the venues were kind of falling down a little bit. Or yeah. But you didn't really care because, you know, this was all fresh and exciting. So it was great, you know. And like you said, when you're young, it's all an adventure. Ah, it's great. I mean, it's an adventure, yeah. you know. It's like. Sure. I never believed I'd get to go to these places. You know, I should have paid attention at school a bit more. You know, but there you go. Um, it's great. Oh, Gary says Leeds and Nottingham squats back then. So, yeah, yeah, there's a few of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I I have great memories of just uh, you know sleeping at somebody's house. I had no idea who it was, and they were kind enough to let ten of us sit sleep, <laughs> sleep in the living room. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. those are those are great memories. Yeah. Um, interesting. I, we didn't touch on this. I don't think you, uh, do you still do your toy company? Well, it wasn't really, it wasn't really my toy company, but a friend of mine, American guy, Dennis, who, um, he, uh, set up some small company of his own in Japan. And through him, we got to do a, a Shane grind kaiju kind of toy monster thing, which I've got one around here. I can't reach it. Like he's over there. <laughs> um, but, um, so yeah, through him we did a few few toys, and I keep on trying to do another a new one really, because um, since then of course Super Seven put out the uh, the scum figure, you know. But um, no, no, it was just a, it was kind of a one off thing to do, you know. Makes sense. Um, our one of our resident historians, Chucky Brown, asks. In 1982, actor Jim Carrey was on the Arsenio Hall show and said he listens to Napalm Death. He said that they should one day do a duet song. Have you seen that interview, and what's your take on it? I've seen the interview quite a few times. Uh, a, lot people, a, lot people, a lot of people send it. I don't know for sure, but of course, if you watch Ace Ventura, the first one, you know it's Cannibal Corpse is in there. Yes, right. And I wonder, I have to wonder, you know, no disrespect to Campbell because they were good friends and I love them. And um, I have to wonder if he, when he was doing that movie, he was like, oh, I kind of want some band like Napalm, you know, in there. And that scene, of course, they did that in Florida. So maybe that's where Campbell just jumped in or someone knew someone who knew somebody. And there you go. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd like to meet Jim Carrey. He seems like a very interesting character. Yeah, I agree with you. He does. He seems like a really interesting character. Yeah. I agree with you on that. Um, oh, geez, I don't know if we, I don't know if we want to go there, Michael, about you know the infamous Pennsylvania Airport Music Hall. You know every, you know, you know a couple bands have this story. You know, Biohazard, uh, Sick of It All, Murphy's Law. You know, basically back then, uh, Airport Music Hall in Allentown, Pennsylvania, was sort of a uh, a gathering place. For, yeah. for, for for that for that ilk, and there was always a lot of uh, heated interactions there. I, you I, and I know you remember it; it's in the book, right? There's a couple of instances, yeah. I mean, I, I remember that one in particular because we hadn't really toured very much, you know, before. I remember a, a little bit of fighting was ensuing, you know, um, uh, and yeah, for for someone I hadn't really experienced uh, much much 
uh, interaction like that before, not in England anyway. So um, I kind of like kind of watched on from the bus in a way. I think I, 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 they didn't need me, that's for sure. It was being taken, right. it was being taken care of by certain people, and uh, that was it. And uh, it's a shame, really. It was a bit of a kind of ruined the gig a little bit. But there you go. Yeah. Um, talk about the malformed Earthborn CD. That's Scott. Well, Scott, if it's a Scott Lewis, I think it is. I'm sure it is. He's the drum. He used to be the drummer of Brutal Truth. Mm. And he was in on Malformed Earthborn with me and Danny Zilker. It was kind of a homage to Skinny Puppy. And mm. uh, we did it on uh, an eight track in Scott's dad's basement, basically after a tour. And it came out on Relapse Records. And uh, I think it cost a grand total of 20 bucks to make. But it sounds, it sounds crazy if you like, yeah. if you like industrial music. Hey, Scott. When is the project with Mick Harris and Justin Broderick getting released? Uh, that's a good question. I was speaking to Mickey today. Um, he had me do all, all manner of bass tracks and, and then scrap them twice, <laughs> which is for Mickey. Because I started to tell you, as Mick said, oh, well, you should, I should have waited until Justin. Yeah, you should have waited until Justin did the riffs. Justin's done the guitar riffs. Oh, thing. God. <laughs> But I think Mickey's just had a tooth out, so he's not doing too well with that. And uh, I'm hoping soon. I'm trying to get him going. That's all I can say. Trying to get him going. Fair enough. Robert Hogg in Scotland. One of my favorite albums is The Code is Red, getting Jello by Afro to sing on The Great and the Good. Nice touch. Yeah, that was a nice one. Um, again, again, Billy sort of helped us. Billy Gore from Faith No More helped us right. get uh, Jello. We met Jello briefly, and ever since then he comes down to the shows. But uh, it was nice to have that because, of course, Jello's vocal tone is so different from Barney's, so it's a really nice, uh, nice mish. You know, it's good. Um, Doug Masters, what's your favorite Judas Priest album? <laughs> mm, yeah, that's a tough one. Probably Sad Wings of Destiny. Good one. Yep, I, I got a question. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but what is a Jungian in, in, individuation? Uh, well, that's a good question. I, do I understand it totally myself? But um, the past three years, I've kind of gone on this psycho psychology trip. Um, they call it analysis, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I saw the question who I was, the balance between home life, life on the road. Mm hmm Felt the time was running through my fingers a little bit. And then mm. um, uh, I think uh, Jonah Hill went through something similar. If you watch the documentary called Stutz, it's a, it's a variation on Jungian psychology. Um, mm -hmm. But we have our shadow part X, the sort of uh, subconscious, unconscious. And that's something that needs to come out fully, really need to sort of address all, all manner of um, – your psyche, I guess, really. I'm just, it's like so, uh, negotiating the labyrinth of life. Yeah, you kind of nailed it there, pretty much. And it, but yeah, there is that labyrinth that you're in. It's almost right. uh, trying to work out. Uh, you're trying to trying to become the most authentic version of you, I suppose. And uh, I get confused myself, really, with what I'm doing. Sometimes I feel it's working, and then of course you 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 face a stumbling block and. It kind of ties in with with Dark Sky Burial. Dark Sky Burial is title, song titles, and music is is all linked to uh, this labyrinth that we this quest in life. We're all on a quest, really. You know, it sounds quite uh, strange to say that, but uh, yeah. So individuation is really about trying to reconcile all the whole part to become a whole a whole a whole person. I think really almost like sort of, almost you, you have to break apart. In some sure. ways, and I certainly broke apart earlier this year. Yeah. And then you try to pick up the good pieces and put yourself back together as a better version of you, I guess. It's like you have to you have to burn it down in order to rebuild it. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah, it, that, and, and, and that can take a long time. I like it I mean, a lot. I like it a lot. People, some people say, "Well, is it working?" Yeah, I'm like, I think it's working, but yeah. it's but it, but it's like. I know some, my friend and mentor says to me that, you know, you, you, you've got this labyrinth and sometimes you, you face a sudden black edge, you go edge, you go through it, around it, and sometimes you think you're okay, then the labyrinth goes like that, mm. you know. And then you're walking, you know, you're trying to walk around and spiral. It's almost like, I don't know, 
it you, you think you know you can do you can be doing well you can slip back down again and you just you know it's i'm still i'm I thought, I'm, I'm pretty sure i don't 100 percent even in in said it myself yet but i feel it's uh making me a stronger person really it seems like it's uh, uh the growth is in the process as we say right it, it to a certain extent the the the, the uh I'm, I'm, and I'm sort of touching back to sort of like a Merry Pranksters thing, but, uh, you know, the trip is in the journey, you know, it, it's in the process itself is, is the discovery. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it could take a while. I think, uh, and, um, I certainly, uh, I crashed hard earlier this year, but I feel like, uh, through that, I'm learning more about myself, I suppose. And what, and when to say no and, uh, you know, be firm about it, I guess. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, let's do a, cu a couple more. We'll wrap it up. Uh, this is an interesting one. Best grunge band you saw live? Uh, that would be Soundgarden. Um, okay. I used to like a little smoke back in the day. And mm -hmm. uh, there was some great Jesus Christ pose came in, and uh, that was it, man. That was uh, some awesome sub bass. And, uh, yeah. I'm not sure. You, I don't know. Can you call them? I suppose you could call them a grunge band. I don't know, but yeah, same God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, you know, it's interesting. I think, like anything else, you look back on a lot of those bands and you're like, grunge? That was a, gr a grunge band? Like, <laughs> it, yeah, it's kind of strange. I mean, an interesting tale is I know that me and Jesse in Los Angeles went to see Allison Chain, Screaming oh. Trees, and Grunt Truck at the Palladium. And we were both a little tipsy. And after that, I went up to Glendale to record. Some of the first Brewer album, so there's mm -hmm. a footnote for you. But um, and Alice and James were great too. But I did like saying, "God, you know, that, 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 that's something about them." You, you know, I, Alice and Chains. I, I tell this story every now and then. Alice and Chains was um, a band that I saw. They didn't move at all, but I couldn't take my eyes off them. It was really, really incredible. For you know, they weren't moving. But I just was, I could not take my eyes off. And they were incredible. When, when they were really, when they were popping, you know, sort of before they slowed down, they, they, they were great. They were fantastic. Oh, they were great. I mean, I'm, I mean not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare call, call this band grunge, but I, mean, I saw Melvin's a few weeks ago. Melvin's yeah. reminded me, you know. But, yeah, uh, they're, still, they're still doing it at a high level for sure. It was loud and heavy. It was great. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, question for Shane. What is the one album you are most proud of and why? Uh, that's not a fair question, but give us a couple. Uh, well, the albums are involved, and I think I'd probably – I like the first Lockup album, which is Pleasures Paved Sewers. That was it. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a great one to make with Nick from – at the time was in Craig LaVille. And um, Enemy in the Music Business, I was proud of that one. Um, and From Enslavement to Alliteration, you know, the first proper Napalm Death album I was on. I'm very proud mm -hmm. of that one. And the last album, Throws of Joy. I'm extremely proud of that one. Gotcha. Uh, good question, RS. Any musicians you want to collaborate with? Uh, well, there's quite a few. Really. I'd like, I'd like to, uh, like to work with Alex Lifeson from Rush. Actually, good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Are you? Uh, I, I, and I know you. I read the book. Um, Favorite Rush album? Mm, that's a tricky one too. There's so many great ones, but uh, um, maybe in pictures probably. Wow. Yes. I I I I go with I I go with the early. I go fly oh, by yeah, night. Yeah, fly yeah, by yeah. night. I love fly yeah, by, by night. night. I fly by night's a great one. They've got so many great ones. I mean, yeah, they're great. You know, when when we played CBGBs on that first show, I think it was just was it late November. So there was I'm a bit of a Christmassy person. You know, so there's a Christmas vibe coming in the air. Went yeah. in the Terror Records and I bought the Presto album. So I'm looking at the Presto album cover and it started snowing in New York, I think, a little bit, you know. So I have fond memories of New York again for, for buying a Rush album of all things. But there you go. Sure. Uh, one of the last ones, Darren S. On Death by Manipulation album, I see that Barney sung tracks 1 through 7 and Lee 9 through 17. How did that come about, Shane, and why with two vocalists? Well, because Death by Manipulation is actually a compilation record mm. where uh, I think it was the Stuff of the Children 7 Inch and probably some extra tracks, and then possibly Mentally Murdered 
uh, mini album was included on that. I can't remember the songs off, off the back of my head, but um, and so they merged two eras of the band. So that's why it's very confusing if you don't know your history of the Napalm Death. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Uh, so when is the Warhammer demo coming out on vinyl? <laughs> I think a, I, I, there's a por- there's a Portuguese label I think already bootlegged it because I because I was like, can you send me some copies please I don't care if you bootlegged it but can you send me a few I actually they, they did they, they did email me and I got to write back to him because I was like who the bloody hell put this out you know and then uh, I thought and he goes oh, just you know. send me a couple copies <laughs> and, that, and that is Hugh Davis and if it's the Hugh Davis I think it is yeah him and his friend Kevin put on the first Warhammer show in Oswald Street if it's you I'm pretty sure it's you. Which wow. I haven't seen you for a while. And he's the one that put it on in Wales back in 85. I'm pretty they damn come, sure. They come out of the woodwork for this show. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully, I should put it out really, but a couple of the guys don't really want to put it out for some reason. I don't know why. I think they kind of. Why wouldn't you want to put a demo out that you played on 35 uh, years? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, my drumming's out of time, but I don't give a shit. Yeah. Yeah, it, right. It's, it's like, I was, you know, I was just vibing. Um, but um, maybe. I mean, I, think, I know it's I know it's been bootlegged, so hopefully we'll, yeah. we'll, try, we'll try and get some copies and redo it. Maybe it's a it's a good one. Uh, how much impact did the BBC documentary have for the band? It was massive at the time, and and even now it's still talked about because they did. You know, they, they, it was a heavy metal documentary. I mean, uh, yeah, it's you, hey it's you. Him. Um, <laughs> it was um, you know, I mean. It was. A, it featured Slayer, Ozzy, Scorpions, Guns N' Roses were really popular at the time. Yeah, you know, they, people, Guns N' Roses fans were pissed off because there was more time given to Napalm Death than Guns N' Roses, and uh, only because the people, the, the BBC liked us. They said, "Oh, you're you're the most down to earth characters. Everyone else just acting like a bunch of rock stars." I don't know, but um, whatever. Um, but it was it was yeah, it was important. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, we, we sort of managed to take it. Um, an asteroid, I guess. Two more. Uh, Chucky Brown, this is a good one. I read this in the book. Heard stories of Shane and members of obituary and atheists driving around Florida, blasting public enemy in the car back in the 90s. LOL, awesome. Well, it was... We all yeah. love that. We all love those early... That, 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 oh, that yeah, I mean, I mean, it was actually... It was mainly just me and Je- me, Jesse and Mitch, actually. We, hired, we all loved that stuff, but Mainly me, Jess, and Mitch. We were hiring. I mean, because you know, I got I got exposed to the super big gulp, you know. And I was like at Seven Eleven, some sixty-four ounce diet, some sixty-four ounce coke thing. I'm like, oh, this is amazing! So I'd get one of them. I mean, Subway wasn't everywhere, so I was like, oh, Subway, amazing. And then Fear of a Black Planet, amazing. What can yeah. you say? Great record. Uh, um, yeah. When Ice Cube kicks in that burn, I would burn. There we go. Lovely. There we go. Doug Masters asks, what was it like being on the final Slayer tour? It was great. Um, you know, that I think that came about primarily through John Araya, which is Tom's brother. Yeah. He goes way back from, from back in the I all go way back, of course. I think he kind of convinced the guys to take let's take some his final tour, take some bands out that represent, I don't know, whatever the underground death metal scene. So we we got off of the one tour and for us it was you know dream come true it was amazing you know we'd get we we'd we'd be finished at six o'clock it's like a, like a traveling world you know yeah yeah we do our show we'd sit there we'd go to the catering and get the cream cakes and we just look through the bus window and see the flames go up and hello wait comes on and i mean that was all right for a few weeks man. And, and you got a good night's sleep too huh <laughs> well, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't drinking then, so yeah, yeah. Because I was, yeah. I was, yeah, yeah but that's a good thing when you play early. You could do all that, and if you do have a little party, you're still in bed by about eleven o'clock. Whereas if you're headlining, yeah. there's none of that going on. You know? Yeah. So, who wants to headline these days? Nah. <laughs> no, 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 not for me. I, I do like I do like my sleep. Man. <laughs> um, I I like this shot that was in the book. Um, did uh, Napalm find a nice? Uh, a lot of love down in South America early on. Well, yeah, um, pretty much when we did the Harmony Corruption. That's on the uh, New Titans tour, I think. Okay. But, uh, but when we did the Harmony Corruption album, we finished that, and during the mixing of it, um, I, I think several tour might have been getting a little bit of 
you know, backlash because they were becoming so popular. I don't know why or something like that. Like, you know, they've been, oh, they're selling out or something. And so Max says, well, we'll show you how we're going to sell out. We're going to bring Napalm Death down to play with us. <laughs> That'll so, teach you. So we did three shows and met. we met the guys. You know, and, of course, I knew several tour from tape trading and all that kind of stuff. And I used to tra trade the records with a couple of guys in Brazil. So I had the albums and loved several tour. And uh, so I got to know the guys and we met Gordo from RDP, Ratas de Barrel, and um, great times. Uh, yeah, loved it. You know, Brazil, you know, brilliant. Uh, Harris, I mean, just touching back on that, Shane and Scott Ian were the only metalheads wearing Public Enemy t-shirts in the old days in concert. Many closed-minded people talking shit about that. Oh, well, that's a shame. I, I, I mean, I, I haven't kept up with the, the today's hip hop, but I, I love my Public Enemy and NWA and Ghetto yeah. Boys kind of stuff. I love that. It's great. Yeah. Um, RS uh, asking about the book. Here it is, RS. Uh, do you have a favorite chapter of the book? Um, a, here is the book, and let me show you where you can buy it. It's a great read. Um, I managed to burn through it in three days. Um, and it can be purchased here at napalmdeathbook.com. Um, any, any particular chapter, uh, a favorite of yours or? Uh, it's hard, it's hard to remember the chapters. I mean, I will yeah. talk about briefly. I'll talk briefly about when I met Ronnie James Dio of Rainbow and yeah. Sabbath. You know, that was a great time for me to meet him. I heard he liked Napalm, but of course, Heaven and Hell is one of my favorite Black Sabbath albums. Oh, yeah. I used to have, me and my friends used to have headbanging competitions to Stargazer, you know, when we were young. Yeah. And so I met Dio and he, he was really nice and. He, he talked about rehearsing for Heaven and Hell in, 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 in uh, Birmingham. And we talked about our favorite curry restaurants because Birmingham is very famous for curries, you know. Is that right? So it, it is renowned. Curry is national food here, really. Um, and we were just, I was just gobsmacked we were, that I was talking to Ron James Dio about curry. And then it was right before my birthday, I, I had a few beers and he put his hand on, his, on my shoulder and said, Shane, you know, I really like Napalm Death. I'm like, I heard, sir. You know, he goes, never give up, man. Never give up. And I had to sit down. I had a tear in my eye. And my wife oh, come over and she goes, why are, you, why are you crying? I said, I've just been, I've just spoken to God, basically. And that was that. That's that's heavy. Last one, I swear. Uh, give us a Marky e. Smith story, Shane. <laughs> Um, Marky Smith, yeah, from the fall, John Peel's favorite band. Um, he was great. He just like you know, we're trying to try, record. Trying to, I recorded an EP with him. I'm not even sure if they even released it actually. But um, um, just that Manchester accent, you know, was a kind of stellar. You know, just uh, the engineer was trying trying to re-record the bass, and he, Marky Smith, thought the bass was fine. He was arguing with the engineer. He's like, no, no, this is great, I kid, I kid. Fucking, this is brilliant, you know. Total Manchester accent. I can't even do it, but um, it was yeah. It was just a, he was a character for sure, and um, he just he just liked uh, the way I played bass. It was a strange uh, thing to be asked to play on the fall, really, which, was, <laughs> which ironically was John Peel's favorite band. So the kind of a weird synchronicity, is it called, or something like that? I believe yeah. they called. It. So yeah. yeah, strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. I want to thank you for coming on the show. It was great getting to know you. I really enjoyed the book. Uh, I thank wish you. you I wish you all the best in your endeavors. Anybody you want to thank or shout out on the way out? Uh, well, thanks to Andy Farrow, uh, getting the opportunity for the book, Rocky 88 books, of course. Uh, Dave Everly, um, Dan Tobin for helping do the press, and uh, just everybody really for helping me get this form, I suppose. <laughs> and once again, pick up the book, www.napalmdeathbook.com. Shane, talk to you soon, man. Thank you. Take care, man. You take care. There you have it. Another good one uh, in the books. Fantastic show. Thanks a lot, everybody, for, for tuning in. Everybody around the world, we had a nice audience, had some nice interaction. Music, the tie that binds us together our community and culture. I love it. I know you do. Best show ever. Is that right? <laughs> well, thank you.
It was a good one. Yes, absolutely. Um, Kenny Clark, thank you. Um, and uh, thanks for all the great questions, everybody. It was a real, it was a real nice interactive show, and, and uh, it was great. So, uh, Drew, this show, great show. Well, thank you. But doing this show off every Sunday. I haven't had a Sunday to myself in three fucking years. <laughs> John, thank you, bro. And by the way, I know I know a lot of people looking forward to uh, this Wednesday. We got Ill Bill coming on the show. So, you know, get ready for that. Um, well, good, Jonathan. I, I'm glad. I'm glad. I was looking forward to it, too. And, and, I, and I highly recommend I highly recommend the book, man. It, it's really great. It's a great read. Yes, Harris. He's a great guy. Absolutely. Um, I'll see you all on, on Wednesday. Thanks again. Love doing this show, and I love that you're a part of it. I, I, I really am. You, you light up my life. Until then, do good things, and good things will come. To you.